Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Fermín Serrano from the University of Zaragoza. I'm the coordinator of the Sosentais project, so I'm going to present a little bit and co coordinate this event again. Um, this is a conference on citizen science for Europe, and we want you to share your concerns, your practices, your experiences, and discuss during the morning. We wanted to prepare something heterogeneous, bringing different actors, different perspectives, and different approaches so to the public engagement in science. So uh, we highly encourage you to, to raise your hand and share your thoughts and share your concerns, okay? Um, the, as you see, the, the schedule is very tight. Uh, we, are, uh, we need to, be to stay focused on the critical issues and the debate. Uh, I, I kindly ask speakers to be strict on time. Uh, we are going to be much more flexible with the audience, so uh, please get ready your presentation. Uh, if, just in case somebody didn't, from the speakers, Eduardo, who is here, he's dealing with the presentation, please be, share your slides with him. Uh, I have to apologize for all the speakers who didn't come here. Uh, it was a bit complicated for us, for the logistics and so on. Uh, well, I think we have an extremely good set of representatives from different initiatives. So I think we can start. Any question, any concern for logistics? We have the coffee break at 11, a little bit too late for some of you, sorry. We have at the end of the morning from 12 to 1 or maybe later, if you want to stay, we can discuss. Uh, there are different sessions. We can have the questions at the end of the session for the speakers or during the talks, however you want. And at the end, of course, we, we have the, the debate, okay? So let's start. The, the, the first session, as you see, is the policy makers and citizen science. We wanted to bring people from the European Commission, from the European Parliament, and also from the United Nations dealing with different approaches on technologies, on, on research and science and politic interaction. This is one of the, the main issues on citizen science now and one of the focus of, of Societa is to discuss also on the policy and society interactions. So uh, I ask Eduardo to share the video from Pablo Echenique who couldn't come. Paolo Echenique is a member of the European Parliament and colleague from our research institution in Zaragoza. He's a physicist and he just moved to the policy, so we decided that he's a very good um, speaker to present this interaction between science and policy. The day before, uh, the Portuguese people overtook the authoritarian government in Portugal the newspapers in Portugal uh, were saying that uh, nobody cared about politics in, in Portugal. Uh, I think that uh, that is a lie. Uh, normal people care about politics, think about politics, and want to do politics. And uh, I think that uh, Podemos has shown that this is true in the, in the field of politics, but I also think that it is true in the field of science. Uh, it is also a myth that nobody uh, is interested in science apart from, from scientists. Uh, I have been involved in a lot of dissemination activities uh, with young people and uh, with people that is not expert in, in science. And, and I can tell you that as long as you uh, put science in accessible terms, uh, almost everybody is interested. Uh, moreover, they are able to participate uh, in, in, in the doing of science, in the making of science, uh, as long as you provide uh, the, the appropriate uh, tools uh, for, so people can do so. Um, both in politics and in science, uh, the new technologies are, are able to to allow people to participate in effective ways and that's not only good for for the people that participate but also for all of us because uh, a thousand brains uh, think better than only one brain only if we are if we are able to 
to make uh, a coherent, to take a coherent result of, of this uh, collective thinking, uh, both in science again and in, and in politics. So, so I think that there is a lot of work to do. We have to think hard because it's not always easy to know how to combine the thoughts, the ideas and the opinions of a lot of people. But, but I, I am confident that we will be able to do that and, and I think that uh, from uh, research funding and from policy making we have a, a very important role to, uh, role to play in this, in this process which, uh, which promises a, a powerful future, a more participatory future both in, in science and in politics. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Pablo. Uh, um, I don't know if you have any question. Maybe by Twitter, he is very active. So, uh, now I want to present the the contribution from Joseph Gaylor from the ITU office from the United Nations. They based in Geneva, and they're working with social innovators and and younger. Uh, younger actors in, in around the world working with uh, citizen journalists in India, with food management in Africa and so on. So I think it's a good perspective also to bring these scenarios to, the, to, to this event. So please. Hi, my name is Joe Gaylord and I'm part of the team at the ITU Telecom World Young Innovators Competition. I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there in person, but I hope that this video presentation uh, kind of makes up for the fact that I couldn't be there. Um, to start off, uh, the Young Innovators Competition is part of the ITU Telecom World, which is a uh, conference that's run by the International Telecommunication Union, which is the part of the United Nations responsible for information and communications technologies of what I'm going to call ICTs. Uh, Telecom World is an annual industry event that brings together industry leaders and governments and regulators and uh, engages in dialogues about the future of the telecommunications industry. So within the Young Innovators Competition is a competition for social entrepreneurs between 18 and 30, and we look at uh, entrepreneurial businesses, innovative businesses that use ICTs to solve different social goals. So, for example, one of the challenges that we had this year was on the use of uh, uh, the digitization of local languages and cultures, or uh, the application of open source technology to disaster management. And we approach two of the major issues that uh, the ITU in general and specifically telecom world really want to work with and really want to address as uh, topics of their work, which are innovation and crowdsourcing. We use a platform called uh, Crowdicity, for, uh, which is a crowdsourcing platform in order to collect ideas and also to uh, co-create ideas for certain challenges that we run. And of course, we're working with innovative new enterprises for uh, the purpose of um, our work. Right. So why is the ITU interested in innovation? Well, we need to stay ahead. This, the communications industry is constantly changing, and it's constantly be just being disrupted. And it's especially being disrupted by young people and outsiders. It's uh, the very rarely does the, the huge innovation, does the huge disruption come from within. And in order to stay ahead of the conversation that we're going to be talking about, in order to stay ahead of the technology that we're going to have to regulate tomorrow, that we're going to have to learn how to use tomorrow as an organization and as an industry, we need to take our conversation from the boardroom to the garage and always make sure that we're interacting with the new and innovative startups that are uh, going to be disrupting the industry in the future. More importantly, we're not just a telecommunications organization. We're part of the United Nations. And so we need to be also making sure that when we deal with these technologies, that we're looking at how they can be applied to social goals. The UN as a system has a development agenda. It looks 
to achieve certain things. Uh, as I said before, two of the ones that we've dealt with this year that fit very neatly into the UN agenda are the preservation of languages and cultures by digitizing them, by bringing them into the online space, and uh, the preparation for disaster management, which we can approach with open source technology. And whenever we do a challenge, whether it's something that we've done on climate change right now or on food waste, any of these issues that we address, they all fit in with the UN development agenda, bringing in WHO and all of the others. Okay, so why is the ITU interested in crowdsourcing? And we've used crowdsourcing on a number of different things. Uh, we use it for policy sourcing uh, with the Beyond 2015 project, which looked at the post-2015 development agenda, and the GPY, which is the Global Program for Youth, that we ran with the uh, Special Envoy for Youth, Ahmed al Andawi, which was an extension of the Beyond 2015 discussion. We've also used it for internal crowdsourcing of uh, ideas related to our agenda, and also we're using it for the this project as well. And um, we also are looking at becoming the, the leader in this, spreading these ideas and help and guiding other UN organizations through the, the crowdsourcing process. And we're interested in crowdsourcing in part for the same reasons that all of the private sector companies, that all of these other organizations are, which are you have a broader knowledge base, you're bringing in outsider opinions, and you're improving your ideation process. You're just getting more ideas that you can pick from and more relevant ones because you're actually asking your users what they want, which is a huge change and it really does improve the ideation process. But we also have reasons that are particular to our space as a UN organization. We have to be transparent and democratic. That's part of our mandate. This is part of what we're required to do. And the crowdsourcing process allows us to do this. Everything's on the table, everything's on the website. You see one for one where the idea came from and how it was used. And now this is particularly, this last point is particularly talking about the uh, development discussions that we've had, but it's tremendous that it inverts the development conversation. What do I mean by that? Well, when I'm talking about the Beyond 2015 discussion, this is where we brought in young people and asked them what their priorities were for the post-2015 development agenda. And this inverts the traditional UN process. Traditionally, within the United Nations, you have experts that discuss what organizations want for their target populations. And this is all right. I mean, it, this is not to discount expertise. Expertise is tremendously important in the areas that we're talking about. But when you talk about a crowdsourced UN process, you're actually getting the population to tell the experts what they want from the organization. It puts the focus on the people that you're trying to aid, the, the populations that you're trying to serve, rather than the, the interests of the experts and the interests of the organizations. And this is an extremely powerful tool, and it has tremendous potential to change the way that we talk about development, that we talk about the work of the UN. So I'm really excited about this. Um, okay about as much time as I have. I've actually ran a little bit over, but um, you can look me up. My email is joseph.gaylord at itu.int, and uh, you can find our uh, competition on Facebook at ITU Young Innovators Competition, and you can find our work at ideas.itu.int. Thank you so much for your time. Again, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there, but I'm really happy that I can send my ideas by uh, uh, video, and yeah, I'm really excited to continue this conversation with you in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Joseph. Maybe he's watching us online. You know, we've, I forgot to say this is going to be, this is being broadcasted now. So I can invite Joe jo Magan to present, please. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, can you hear me now? So to, I'm just going to talk about citizen science in the context of digital science, so, to, so you can see how we see it in DG Connect. So going very quickly through, so digital science, as, as you know, is doing science differently through ICT, and we see, we see citizen science as a very important component of that.
So basically doing science differently, doing science be better, but it's not new science. And here we have uh, our outgoing commissioner, Nelly Cruz, who has been a, a real champion for what we're doing in digital science and citizen science. And um, we're delighted to see that thanks to her efforts, and our efforts too, I hope, um, the, the, the dossier for uh, digi the digital agenda dossier has become even more important in the new commissioner. In the new commission, and we've got even two commissioners to, to look at what we do in the future. But um, just to reassure you, we don't expect to have any major changes in our, um, in our policies for the, for the moment. So, just to talk now about what we are doing in digital science and the challenges that we see, we deal with it in four main components. We have the e-infrastructures, which is the, the, the platforms for how we do digital science. So, for example, how we handle big data. Then, of course, there's the whole area of open access, open access to research results, open access to research data. Um, then a, a new area we call global system science. So this is basically trying to use evidence-based data for, uh, for, doing, for feeding into policy. And last but definitely not least, citizen engagement, citizen science, and even crowdsourcing, and possibly eventually crowdfunding for, for our research activities. And there's a set of challenges in all of these that we're trying to address in the infrastructures. We're trying to establish these virtual research environments so that people can move seamlessly throughout Europe and, and do uh, research wherever they are. Um, of course, for the open access, we have to think about alternative models for publishing and uh, for, for handling issues such as text and data mining. By the way, the whole text and data mining and the copyright dossier has been moved to RDG and the new commission as, as, as maybe a sign for, for a, a shift in that area as well. Um, for evidence-based policy making and GSS, we want to try to link better articulate the link between what we're doing in science and the data that's produced and the policy making. So we're working with our colleagues in DG Markt, for example, on, on trying to do that. And then in citizen science, trying to mainstream it, trying to move from isolated examples of best practice, as we have many of them, and, and Socientize has done a great job in publicizing them, to, maybe, to make this a mainstream tool, to, to mainstream it in, in our research activities, not only inside the European Commission and the um, community programs, but mainstreaming it throughout Europe, the European research landscape. And, of course, underlying all of this, we need to have alternative metrics for, for how we do science and how we measure the science and research, how the impact of individual researchers and the impact of their re research work. So, overall in this, we're trying to develop a culture change for the researchers, for the organizations, and for the industry. So, it, it's, it's no small challenge. But to handle that, we're, we're delighted we've got a, a whole range of activities. Uh, we like to highlight Socientize here as part of that. And we feel that the work this project has done and the white paper it's produced has been very, very important in, in articulating um, the work there. So, but I won't go through all of these examples. But there's, there's other challenges though. So how do we, what, how do we, um, develop, how do we mainstream participatory bottom-up practices like we've got with citizen science and got with Socientize? And we've got to do a whole raft of work. It's not just a question of, of providing the platform. We've got to do the, the infrastructures. We've got to develop the tools. We've got to, to do research on how this process works. And that's what we're trying to do in, the, in, the next, um, in our next work programs, to try to address the research issues and how we can better uh, do citizen science and participatory projects. One example of what we're doing there, we've, we've just launched uh, collective awareness platforms inside our DG. Um, the closing date is in March. And this is an example of the type of bottom-up participatory projects that, that we're, we're, we're trying to encourage. Um, is maybe some of you and some of your community could be interested in this as, as an example. There'll be other examples my colleague from DG Research will talk about uh, just after me, so there's more there. So that's uh, from the past, but let's, what's the next immediate steps in our future? Well, one of them is we have a consultation that we've launched together with our colleagues in DG Research 
on the future of science, science 2.0. There's a lot of debate on what, what labels we should be using, digital science, open digital science, science 2.0. In fact, that's one of the questions on this consultation. And I'd like to urge you all, if you haven't already done so, to please participate in this and uh, to, to give your answers, because the, the, the more feedback we get, the better we can demonstrate um, the, the importance of this area, and also the better the quality of the, of the work we're going to get. Um, but following on from that consultation and using also input like we've got with the white paper on citizen science from Socian Ties, where we have a set of uh, validation workshops between September and December. And based on that, then we're maybe looking forward to a policy document in maybe 2015, something like a communication on the next way of doing science, science 2.0, open science, as you wish. Um, but another thing we're trying to do as well is mainstreaming citizen science in our work program. So we're, we're calling for specific citizen science type tools to address things like in, uh, um, social challenges inside the ICT work program. We're going to be calling explicitly for that. It's not in the work program yet. We're still developing that work program for 20, 2016, 2017, I think. Um, but, but we're getting there. And in all of this, I'd like to highlight the role that this project has played, this project Socientize, because it's, been a, it's an accompanying measure. It's not one of our mainstream research projects, but it's, it's an accompanying measure, which means we just fund the extra work that, that is done. But it's a beautiful example of how a relatively small project can have a very big impact. I know I probably shouldn't be speaking now. This is the kind of thing I should say at the end, but I won't have a chance to talk to you again. So a small project with great impact, and I think it's a credit to the, the, the work of all the partners done. So I was very delighted to have inherited it from my, um, from my colleague, Kirsty Alamutka, and I'd like to acknowledge the, the work of Fermin and all his team and all his colleagues in, in what they've done here today. So just to leave you with, um, there's our contact details and the, and the Twitter, Twitter, what's, Stephanie, I can't remember what the term is, Twitter feed, Twitter address. Um, so I'd like to encourage you all to follow this and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. And, and please do follow the, um, the, the open consultation on Science 2.0. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Any question from the audience or maybe later after Jose Miguel? Rubio from. Yeah, please. Please present with your name. Present yourself with the name and where you come from. Okay. Uh, the new Commissioner for Digital, si Digital Economy and Society is. Uh, Mr. Oettinger from Germany, who was the previous commissioner for DG Energy. But we also have a vice president, ANSIP, who is responsible for the digital single market. So if this is the new configuration in the new commission. It's, uh, we're not, we still have to wait and see how exactly it'll work in practice. But uh, it's, it's a mark for the importance of the, of the whole dossier. At least that's what we'd like to see it. Okay. Uh, I'm Jose Miguel Rubio. I work at the European Commission, like John, but uh, I work in the DG research, actually in the earth observation uh, sector within the Climate Action Unit. I would like to introduce the, very quickly the concept of citizen observatories, different approach to citizen science. Uh, citizen observatories are five projects which are, funding, uh, are funded by the Seven Framework Program for Research. Uh, from which uh, we will also have a follow-up in Horizon 2020 uh, research program. Well, I, I, the background of or the rationale for this project, I'm not going to say anything that you don't know. Uh, you okay. know, citizen science is something which is not new, but thanks to the new technologies, the new um, uh, that John has already introduced, thanks to the internet, thanks to the to the new wave of new applications, it's possible now to 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 um, have the citizens participating actively or 
give them the possibility to participate in the in the environmental the local environmental decision making it's possible now to raise awareness uh, about the local environmental issues and we want to benefit from this opportunity so that's why we have included this uh, topic in the in our work program and these projects have now to deal with a series of challenges um, um, for example how to reconcile the quality of the data coming from citizens with the uh, quality of the data from authoritative sources how to deal with aspects like privacy, data security, how to involve a broader spectrum of society rather than the typical groups that are uh, involved in citizen science, like students, um, etc. So, uh, well, what is actually a citizen observatory? Citizen observatory, is, I, I take the definition from one of my projects. Uh, citizen observatories um, are communities of citizens which are sharing on one side technological solutions, uh, portable devices, mobile applications, web platforms, and also uh, community participatory governance methods aided by the new social media streams like Facebook, Twitter, with the objective of one side to uh, improve the local decision making by involving citizens in, in the process, uh, and not only citizens but different stakeholders, and also, which is very important as well for us as Earth Observation Unit, to complement the um, traditional Earth Observation systems by uh, a very wide, denser uh, network of observations provided by citizens. Um, this is a step forward to a more participatory democracy. So this is something which is part of the rationale for these projects. Um, we want citizens to access the information they need so they can have better informed decisions about their uh, activities, about the local environment. And um, there is a need as well to, uh, in order to face different challenges that we are um, now having to, to, to cope with, uh, we need to engage a broader spectrum of society. So this is also another opportunity for us. Um, it's definitely a win-win situation. One side we empower communities and on the other side we enhance our in-situ monitoring capabilities by um, also limiting the chairs on the public purse. But we, um, <clears throat> in, the, in our work, we, we have to also to take, uh, to be careful and to make sure that the official in situ observation networks, the authoritative ones, they are vital because we need to calibrate and validate what citizens are also measuring. But we have to also to, to be careful and we um, have to make sure that citizens doesn't, do not see us as just asking them for providing data, but also to work with them, not only on them or for them. So that's why we included a um, topic in our uh, 2012 work program um, of FP7 in the environment theme. Um, we were looking for projects trying to cover the whole information chain from monitoring and collecting to interpret and deliver information for citizens and also for local authorities, associations, etc. Uh, we were very lucky because we managed to fund five projects, uh, which started in late 2012. Um, and actually they are covering different um, fields. Uh, for example, we have Citizens, which is about quality of life in cities. It's a four-year project. Um, uh, we sense it again as well as a four-year project which is focused on water quality issues and also water-related hazards. We have COPOF as well, which is uh, working on pilot cases in the UN UNESCO World Network Biosphere Reserves. We have seed clubs about coastal, and optical, uh, coastal notion optical monitoring. And finally, we have OmniScientist, which is a two-year project which is coming to an end uh, also in September, and uh, which is about other monitoring and tomorrow we will have the final conference in Brussels, so you are very welcome to, 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 to attend. 
Yes, I, I cannot go obviously uh, through all the projects, but I want just to to make um, to give a couple of examples on how uh, the projects are approaching uh, the citizens in order to to make them participate uh, and to make them engage in this process. Uh, in the case of citizens, they are developing a series of methodologies and protocols to empower citizens and to make them participate in in the de in local decision making. Uh, they are. Um, carrying out a series of pilots in nine European cities. Uh, so they are developing uh, methodologies tailored for, for each pilot area and they are uh, f for achieving, for trying to, to, um, to be success in these pilots, they are engaging citizens' organizations and public authorities of each area, of, of each city, trying to be as inclusive and flexible as possible. Uh, they are negotiating with the local teams what are actually the topics, the challenges that they want to address in, in the project. Um, and with um, these pilots, we are going to receive info about the effectiveness of the approach and trying to analyze in a coordinated way um, what are the outcomes of each uh, pilot case in order to provide at the end of the project a methodology or series of best practices. And the second one is we sense it. They are implementing a collaboration um, environment. Uh, they are gathering official information and volunteer information from crowdsourcing. And with all this information, they are trying to provide services both for citizens for authorities, as uh, we sense it is trying to uh, address uh, water-related hazards, like for example floods, we are collaborating with um, emergency services in a series of um, pilot areas in UK, in Italy and in the Netherlands, and they are also developing a series of uh, new sensors. Um, for um, amateur scientists and also for non-experts in order to try to provide um, information, reliable information, while keeping the costs as low as possible. Uh, they are focused very much on how to provide feedback to authorities and to citizens in order to, to uh, raise awareness about uh, these issues. Um, of course, uh, we are trying to um, make them all these five projects to work together, so they are cooperating in a framework, and also we are um, make them uh, well provide the information that they are obtaining through a global platform, which is the Global Earth Observation System of Systems, and the, uh, we are also organizing a series of workshops and coordinating uh, coordination meetings. The next one will be here in Brussels. It will be a big event on 4th of December, uh, which is a city observatories empowering the European society. You are very welcome to attend. And uh, in these uh, workshops, we try to discuss about uh, a series of issues and challenges, and uh, I expect that we will also do here afterwards. Um, a series of concerns, uh, aspects that we know that we have to face in these projects is um, first we have to make sure that we provide feedback to citizens in order to, to keep them engaged. Uh, because they can come once, but if they don't receive any anything in return, they may not come back. Uh, we have to find the balance between citizens' expectations uh, and also authorities' fears. Uh, and a key of su for success of these activities is in the involvement in co-design of the citizens and citizens associations, without forgetting that there is no one-size-fits-all solution, so we have to take into account cultural and social issues. So m more money for <laughs> about money about uh, um, and topics for the next uh, um, framework program for research for Horizon 2020. We have launched a topic, which is a follow-up of citizens observatories. Uh, we are calling for innovation actions, um, trying to um, well. Um, asking for projects which uh, have to develop further and test in real conditions this concept, focus on the land cover and land use management, 
management, sorry, um, and uh, trying to make sure that we have involved SMEs and citizens associations. We have the uh, the call will be open in December, and the deadline will be in April next year. And there, is, there, are, there are in principle 20 million euro for this for this topic. So finishing my presentation, uh, I welcome you again to the event that we are organizing here in Brussels for December about citizen observatories. We are going to discuss about what the, um, uh, how citizen observatories can um, contribute to the uh, validation, the implementation of environmental policy making. So I think we will have very interesting discussions. You can already register in this link. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Any question? Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm a bit surprised that uh, the DG research appears to uh, restrict um, citizen science to the environment topics. Uh, is it going to be different as part of the H2020 agenda, or will it be the same uh, with kind of restriction to environmental observatories in terms of uh, science uh, public engagement. Uh, I'm Mark Lipinski from uh, CNRS in France. Well, actually, it's not restricted. Um, I mean, we have a series of activities in the uh, op uh, digital science part. Uh, we are in charge of the uh, Societal Challenge 5, which is climate action, resource efficiency. And as we think that uh, for, um, in order to address environmental challenge, citizens are very important. That's why we have included this. But uh, we have to make sure that in Horizon 2020, we mainstream citizen science in other areas. But of course, it's not restricted uh, at all. I mean. Yeah, if I can just add, the collective awareness platforms are very open in scope. We, we're inviting people from all sorts of domains, not just environmental. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Karen Fabri, and I'm here with my colleague Giuseppe Borsalino, and we're from a, a unit called Science with and for Society. And we have a program that's basically called Responsible Research and Innovation, and this is a cross-cutting issue of Horizon 2020, so I'm replying directly to the comments of this gentleman. Um, part of this Responsible Research and Innovation, it, I would even say the most important part of it, is what we call multi-actor and public engagement. And this notion of multi-actor and public engagement is thus being mainstreamed or embedded throughout the whole of Horizon 2020. Um, and citizen science is, of course, part of, 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 this, uh, uh, of this concept. Um, we, are now, um, we have now drafted a, a first version of a vademecum on how to engage citizens and multiple actors in research and innovation. Um, so this is something that's going to be rolled out uh, quite soon, and we're also planning training workshops for staff and also members of the advisory groups um, later in January. So let's say that there's, there's something in the pipeline and of course we're going to be doing this together with our colleagues in DG Connect and other colleagues in DG Research. But this is, uh, let's say, early news because there's nothing yet ready uh, um, uh, to go out. Uh, but uh, just so you're aware that we are, we are active in uh, in this and taking it very seriously in Horizon 2020. We're very pleased to see that two of our initiatives, uh, RRI Tools and Societize, are with you here today. So um, uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to stay that much longer, but uh, perhaps uh, some of the people that are representing the, these projects and, and, and Giuseppe will, will be staying on. Um, if there's any further questions, we can, we're happy to, to intervene. Thank you. Any other question? Well, thank you for uh, presenting your perspective. Everybody tools is going to be presented there. And definitely it's a very good approach in the, uh, in the task of mainstreaming citizen engagement and social values. Yeah. Any other question? From, no? 
Okay, so let me present one of the highlights of the agenda today. The, no, I'm going to uh, do a brief presentation of the sentence of the, uh, one of the deliverables, one of the outcomes from the project is the, what we, a document with policy recommendation that we have called uh, White Paper on Citizen Science in Europe. Let me see if it works. So, Briefly, Sosentais is a coordination and support action funded by the European Commission from the Digital Science Unit. Uh, the budget is very tight, as you see, 700,000 euros. Brief, and we have, done, we have been working for two years, and we are finishing in the next few days. So um, I am representing here the a very nice consortium from, with partners from Spain, Portugal, Brazil, and Austria. Uh, we have involved external advisory board members from the States, uh, UK, and, and we have subcontracted also a couple of application and research groups from Barcelona and from Geneva. So uh, we understand citizen science as a wide concept, uh, reflecting any kind of contribution from the general public, uh, providing value for researchers, and in the broader sense. So there are, as you all know, there are many models of participation from volunteer computing, volunteer sensing, volunteer thinking, crowd creation, crowd crafting, uh, these hackathons, these grassroots initiatives, and also the collective intelligence. No? So we have run uh, some experiments to prove the concept, to show our capacity and to enlighten the people. Uh, we have run seven experiments within the Sosentais project, and we have also done all the support activities for all these projects and for the consultations, meaning uh, participatory workshops, uh, conferences, competitions, uh, um, and so on. Okay, You can see some of the activities we have done so far. Um, but the main goal, finally, was to understand what's happening in the world of citizen science in Europe, to contact with all the stakeholders, with at least some of the key actors in the different, from the different perspective, like we have today here, all together, and to analyze the big, uh, the cross-cutting concerns, analyze the key issues that we must address, these areas in need of change, to suggest an initial set of recommendations that we published last year in what we called the Green Paper on Citizen Science was published on November. And this Green Paper has been a facilitator for debate, for refinement and endorsement for the last year. And this has evolved to, we have reshaped somehow the, the policy recommendations to this white paper. You can see now the the cover with the list of contributors. Uh, I like this idea to bring in the, all 200 contributors to the to the cover of the document. It's very, it's a good metaphor. Okay, so there are many uh, good doc documents and reports and strategic papers. Our approach in this project, instead of presenting again the successful case studies like Folded, Suniverse, Boeing, Arduino, and so on, we wanted to, to be complementary and focus on the, on the feeling of the community, you know, bringing new actors and new perspective into the scene. Um, and it is important to highlight that this is not our, uh, our feeling, this is not a document that we have created with our expertise. We have uh, coherently um, engaged different actors and shape all together, okay? This is so, most of the things we are, we agree with them, but it, this is the feeling of the committee so far. And this is a, a picture of the last two years in citizen science. Maybe in six months you read, you read again the white paper and you say it's out of date because it's a very challenging moment, but we, this is what we have today. So please go to sentais.eu, the website, and you, you see the link for the premiere of white paper and you can download it in digital format. Um, and that's it. Uh, let me present briefly what we have done, uh, the process and the, some of the outcomes. We understood the challenges from the European, from the European society mostly, uh, that we want to the collective engagement, 
and three big pillars to address social and cultural and scientific values into the scene, not only economic values, right? Uh, we want to have for Europe uh, scientific evidence to foster the knowledge-based decision at all the levels. And we need new actors, new perspective, and we have to co-create jo uh, joint solutions for the future, okay? So these challenges, uh, we have addressed three, three lines of action, three, a kind of three lines roadmap with macro level, micro level, and meso level, addressing macro level the policy makers and policy funders. The meso level are all these uh, mediator, uh, citizen science, um, scaffolding infrastructure, and so on. And the micro level are the actors, the researchers, hackers, makers, and so on. So for the macro level, some of the proposed actions is to to mainstream citizen science in all the European uh, policy and scientific programs, to, to consider citizen engagement a fundamental part of the projects, similarly to dissemination. Some years ago, everybody was forced somehow to outreach. So now we encourage people to um, involve the citizens from the beginning in the co-creation of the project. Um, and again, one of the recommendations is targeted programming, specific calls for citizen science that we have seen today in order to sustain what is going on uh, already and to bring new actors into the scene to highlight the impact. So there are many uh, support measures I won't go into detail, but at the end for the macro, uh, we suggest somehow the um, the creation of a reflection group, a strategic discussion forum to keep this uh, debate ongoing at European level and bring representatives from different countries into regularly uh, into a scene, what we have called citizen science think tank, um, which can be done at European level and also at in all the member in all the countries from the European member states. Um, this think tank could be understood as a mess of mediator infrastructure and the roles of all this infrastructure should be to prepare generic plans uh, serving different perspectives and different concerns and to suggest a specific plans for engagement, for dissemination, for metrics, for um, educational purpose that finally in the future the different actors could adopt and adapt. Uh, we have seen today already different, European is very complex a scenario and there are many different values in different countries, different cultural and economic situations and that all of them must be uh, bring together. And this meso folding, uh, this meso infrastructure must play a, a role of connecting different uh, well, different actors from the community, different con uh, levels. Mediators are playing an interface role between the actors and the policy makers. This is very important to help uh, the policy makers to, bring, to work together with new actors, unexpected actors, okay? And um, this will have a multiplier effect. At the end, all these plans that we are saying, the evaluation uh, plans, the um, dissemination, engagement plans that the people could adapt, this is what we have called the community of practice. Okay? And the micro level, that is the, the, main, the main issue here is that there are many things happening out there. Uh, citizen science is what we expect and many more. Um, uh, every day you find new perspective, new actors, new projects. Surprisingly, um, the community is, ha is growing themselves. So we have to learn from them, we have to get them on board, and we have to in involve in all the stages of our projects. So with teachers uh, playing a very important role for the educational purpose, um, empower and release open source tools and so on. Every, all these recommendations are explained and justified more efficiently in the document. I don't, I don't want to go into the day. 
but this is the, the, the one of the outcomes from the discussion is that um, it is a challenge. No? We, we have been struggling how to balance the, the requirement, the need for regulation and support and funding with the um, grassroots initiative and the creativity that needs no regulation and it's hard to, to fund this. So this is one of the conclusions. And that's all. Thank you very much. And go to the website and download it, please. Isabel is one of the members of the Urban Beast Project. I think. So uh, thank you, Fermin, for inviting us, and thank you, Society, for giving us uh, the opportunity to end this project for this subcontract. No. Okay, um, so Joseph Perio is could not be here because he is attending a scientific conference in Italy, so it's really uh, obliging. So we'll try to to present this project as as good as he would have done. So uh, we are a, a research group called Open Systems. We are at the University of Barcelona at the Fundamental Physics Department. And we are running very diverse project, and the common point of all these projects is that uh, we are taking into account art and citizen participation as a central part uh, of the research project. So the Urban Beast project uh, was starting because these are quality sensors of the city where we live, but how can we capture and decode uh, the information they provide? So it is a project with three partners, so Open Systems, Meliferopolis, which is a, an initiative in, in Helsinki in Finland, and Open B Lab, which is a, a group in Bordeaux, which is uh, collaborating with the, um, the contemporary, contemporary Museum there. So the actors uh, we wanted to involve in this project are environmental scientists, urban beekeepers, physicists of the science of complexity, technologists, artists, and in general, anyone interested. And the tools we used were local sensors and open software and hardware. So first of all, why bees? So there was a quote uh, which has sometimes be attributed to Albert Einstein saying, uh, if the bee disappeared, then uh, the humanity would have four, le four years left to live. Well, we don't know, really. <laughs> But uh, what is true is that uh, there is a big concern uh, regarding the bee uh, population decrease. And why urban bees? So this is a map of the urban bee hives in Europe. So here you see that we, we have a lot in, in the UK, especially London, and some in, in Geneva, for example. So here is the London map. So there is really a huge potential uh, to monitor the environment through uh, the urban beehives. And also probably there are some strange scientific strange things about urban bees. So here it's um, some news about uh, a study they did in, in the UK and a lot of school boys and girls uh, looked at the flowers uh, in the city and they found that surprisingly in the city um, there were much more bees than in the, in the country. So what's the role of citizen science in this project? So, well, in fact, bees are just an excuse to mix a lot of concepts and disciplines. So starting from an environmental issue, then we can include citizen participation, we can include collective experimentation, and then open the data and finally do research. So what did we do? So actually the project started in 2012, but in the frame of the scientists, we started with a, with a workshop in March, and we did it in, in Hangar, which is, a, which is an art center in Barcelona. And the goal of the workshop was to equip, collectively arrive with local sensors, and also with open uh, software and hardware. So it was an hands-on workshop. It was open to everyone. 
uh, we tried to combine scientific and artistic practices. It was a community process, and um, we wanted to, to do multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary research, not only physics or environmental sciences, but also social sciences, because we are very interested in understanding the social processes that are happening uh, inside church workshops. So these are the pictures, for example. So the yellow thing is a big counter, so because we want to know how many bees are coming in and out. This is a, a weight sensor. So here we, we have all the participants. So it was really nice because a lot of different um, participants from different backgrounds uh, joined. For example, we had people from urban gardening, we had architects, we had people from environmental science, uh, from agriculture. So we have a, a video in, uh, in Vimeo that you can look at. Um, maybe I, I will just put a few seconds because we don't have time to, to watch. Um, so during the workshop, what we did is to, uh, to build the sensors. So we had weight, we had humidity, we had an accelerometer, um, and, and try to, to make it run. So this is, for example, it was the big counter. We had a 3D printer also to, to build the, the, um, some part of the sensors. So if you want, the video is, is online, you can have a look. So after the workshop, it was two days, so we, we had to finish a little bit the, the, the equipment. So we, we put the two beehives in a laboratory of uh, electronics in the university, and we finished to, to check up things and, and to adapt the sensors. And finally, in June, uh, then we could install the, the beehive, well, the first beehive. So this is um, a very nice place and in the Museum of uh, Natural Sciences in Barcelona. And they have, they have the terrace with already some, some bees. So it was a perfect place, really, to install. Here you have some pictures. So, of course, physicists have to put this strange coat of beekeepers. It was very funny. And finally, we put the bee inside, and, and we connected everything. And also, um, the bees are really a, a good opportunity to, to involve a citizen, because the day after we installed the beehive, there was a, this uh, science festival, and we took the opportunity to do some uh, artistic installation, <laughs> and it was we, what we did, we transformed. The, the data into sound. So the people would uh, pass by and, and listen to the database and they were looking uh, up and see the beehives, so it was, it was nice. So where we are now, uh, the hives are connected to internet, they are sending data to a server that is at the University of Barcelona. We have also streaming sound on, and video. And now what we are building is the website and data uh, visualization. Of course, all the data will be open. And the next steps, so now we have the data, of course, uh, we have to do research. We want also to, to use this BI to, for education um, processes and also to upscale. Um, so what I was saying about the bees, it's a very nice subject to really to communicate also science. So here we are to uh, articles in the newspapers in Catalonia, and also one, one article about uh, citizen science that Fermin also was interviewed, I think. So we also tried to, to link this scientific topic to, to this festival of science and technology, and we organized artistic activities related with the bees. So we did, for example, um, a noni forensics lab where the people could analyze the, the honey. And we did uh, one quite funny activity, which was this uh, colony collapse cuisine. So there were some artists doing a performance, and people could uh, try between uh, eating uh, food produced in a, in a world with a bee, which is uh, 
the food on the, on the right or eat food uh, if we have no bees, which is not very attractive. So we went also this project in uh, another initiative that we have, which is called Barcelona Citizen Science Office, and where we're trying to, to boost all the citizen science project of Barcelona, uh, trying also to share resources. So it was, uh, for example, a picture of a um, conference organized in, ju in June, and we also collaborated. Uh, this is Stefan Milkelberg from Ars Electronica, which has also a project on bees. And, well, finally, I talked a lot about Barcelona, but also we did something parallel in Helsinki. So this is, and it was almost the same process. They did a workshop, and then they connected the, the BIF. So um, here you have uh, our contact data. Thanks a lot for your attention, and if you have any questions, we'd we'll be happy to, to answer. Thank you, Isabel. It's fascinating. And um, now we want, wanted to have on board also one, uh, another experiment supported from Sosentais, which is called Antimatter from a research group at CERN, led lead by Michael Doser, who is not able to come here. So, and again, one more video. And this project has not been launched yet within Sosentais. But it's a good opportunity to keep on running, and definitely it will be a very good opportunity to people to participate and come to to our website to download the white paper also. And the matter it's using crafting technologies, which maybe is presented later. And by Vosa. The Aegis experiment at CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics, are investigating the properties of antimatter in order to address the fundamental question about the universe. Why does it not contain equal amounts of matter and antimatter, as would be expected? The experiment that we're carrying out needs to form antimatter, so we use CERN's particle accelerators for that, but also detect it with sensitivity. For that, we use photographic plates, together with the fact that when antimatter meets matter, they annihilate each other in a tiny fireball, out of which new particles and antiparticles come flying. When these fly through the photographic plates, they expose the silver bromide along their trajectories. When the film of the photographic plates is developed, these trajectories can thus be seen as very thin lines. By scanning the photographic plate under a microscope and focusing progressively deeper into the photographic emulsion, deeper and deeper layers become visible so that we and the involved public can see the trajectories in their full three-dimensional glory, determine how much energy the fragments lost, this is the darkness of the line, and how far into the photographic plate the fragments flew before coming to a stop or leaving the plate. How the fireball behaves is poorly understood, and furthermore depends on the type of matter that the antimatter meets. The outcome is not the same in the case of beryllium or lead, and our public science project wants to systematically explore this by annihilating antimatter, specifically antiprotons, in thin films placed directly on the surface of the photographic plates. Thin because we want the particles and nuclear fragments coming out of the fireball to be able to reach the photographic plates and be detected there. We rely on the human capacity to detect patterns even from flimsy signals to tell us how many particles and how many fragments are produced for each type of thin film, be it beryllium, lead, silver, aluminum, silicon, gold. The resulting knowledge will help produce a deeper understanding of the annihilation process itself, but also tests models of the nucleus in a novel manner. The project started at a web fest last year, with half a dozen volunteers putting together a prototype proof of principle, and is now ready, thanks to funding from the EU, to take the next step, the beta release. Rather than select a handful of volunteers from the general public, we have decided instead to focus on two dozen high schools around the world in which science teachers and their classes will be involved in telling us what to improve, asking us questions about physics, and hopefully coming up with suggestions for things that we have not thought of, but might be able to test in the coming months. This project, by building on the fascination with the concept of antimatter, 
will thus hopefully allow science teachers in different countries around the world to propose a direct link to active research to their class and can hopefully be extended to include many other areas in which the Aegis experiment is involved, all of them at the forefront of physics. Quantum optics, nanostructured materials, material science, ultra-thin membranes. These are all rather abstract areas of research, but they can be given a human face by involving the graduate students and researchers working on them. Managing the interaction between the high school teachers and students on one hand, and the researchers on the other, requires a community manager who, thanks again to the same EU funding, has started guiding, as well as following, our attempts to make this project a useful platform for science, but, perhaps even more importantly, for attracting and involving the next generation to science and technology. Thank you. Any questions so far? We are running a little bit late, unexpected, okay. It's my pleasure to present here uh, Francois Gray, who is a leader of the community for years, and um, he's starting a new section of the program today, presenting European Commission funded projects uh, that are already ongoing. So it's a good opportunity for all of, you, all of us. Thank you, Fermin, and thanks, everybody. So I wanted to introduce a, an EU project called the Citizen Cyber Lab. Uh, to introduce it, I wanted, though, to also uh, take the opportunity, since we were just hearing from my colleague at CERN, uh, to tell you how I stumbled into this um, and we got involved at CERN in citizen science. It's already a decade ago. We ran a, what we thought was a public outreach project for the 50th anniversary of CERN, and in exactly 10 days we're going to celebrate the 60th anniversary of CERN. The place gets older and older. Uh, and uh, what we did at that time, 10 years ago, you know, this is a long, long time ago before Facebook and all that stuff, is we, we wanted to show the power of distributed computing, so we set up a project similar to SETI at Home called LHC at Home. And we simply contacted the guy behind SETI at home and said, how should we do that? And he said, I have an open source platform I, I'd like you to test out called Boink. And many of us in, in particular at Iber CVS now know this platform and use it a lot. Uh, so LHC at home has been running for a decade. What does it do? In a nutshell, it helps the uh, uh, accelerator scientists to simulate millions and millions of circulations of protons in this Large Hadron Collider in order to find if there are any instabilities of the beam. So it's really an engineering project and it's, it directly impacts the uh, running of the LHC, uh, making sure that they can run it in a safe area. So uh, the discovery we made 10 years ago when we launched this as a PR stunt was, first of all, without any effort to advertise it, we had a thousand people in in 24 hours join this, uh, 10,000 at the end of the week. By the way, this was before the LHC and the Higgs boson became famous. This was before Dan Brown. So we were totally surprised our server crashed and so on. What we learned, though, over the coming uh, months and years, because the scientists said, please, please, please don't turn this off, was, um, was a lot of things about the community. And what surprised us, we hadn't anticipated perhaps, was just how much the community spent uh, time discussing the science behind this, also looking at the technology, uh, tuning their computers to make them really good, and then competing for credit, turning essentially this, this science uh, activity into a game uh, in teams, uh, individually, whatever. Uh, so there was a lot going on socially, uh, sociologically, you could say, that we, we hadn't anticipated. And one of the things that really fascinated us was that people were learning science it was not our intention to make this an educational tool. So um, uh, a, a five years ago, we launched something called the Citizen Cyber Science Center between CERN, the UN Institute of Training and Research, and the University of Geneva, where I'm currently based. Uh, and this was to promote uh, citizen science tools, uh, especially that make access to citizen science easier in developing countries. So we've done a lot of work in Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, and Latin America uh, in that direction. Now, now, two years ago, we launched uh, with colleagues at uh, several leading citizen science institutions in Europe, we launched this project, um, Citizen Cyber Lab, and we really wanted to focus in on the issue of, 
you know, what are people learning from participating in these, in these sorts of uh, activities and how much more could they learn if we put some effort into designing projects uh, uh, with that goal in mind. And in particular, could we go beyond just learning about science to actual scientific creativity, people making discoveries, new things, as Michael Dozer was uh, uh, alluding to in his, in his introduction. Uh, so this is a project led by a group at Université Paris Descartes uh, with collaborators at University College London, Imperial College, a, an SME called Mobile Collective, and the partners of the Citizen Cyber Science Center. And so, um, uh, you know, since I only have a few minutes, I'm going to go through this diagram in great detail. Um, no, just uh, actually not going to go through it in great detail. What this is is what uh, some of the sociologists and anthropologists on the project have come up with in terms of a of what they're seeing as they interview large numbers of participants in many different kinds of projects, not just volunteer computing, volunteer thinking, uh, and, and, uh, and many other types. And uh, I'd like to focus on, on just one point uh, which really struck me and I hadn't anticipated. It's in the lower left-hand corner. It's about the identity of the participant and it says self-confidence. One of, the, one of the main feedbacks that, that was really uh, strong was how people had, uh, if, if the project was well designed, uh, their self-confidence in being able to do science increased. Um, uh, and that this was one of the really positive outcomes for the individuals participating. Uh, and I think that unfortunately a lot of projects, including ones that we've, we've done, don't take this into account. And many people give up early and perhaps lose self-confidence uh, because they don't understand the project, they can't install the software or something like that. So it's definitely something we've learned uh, from this project that we need to focus on much more uh, by putting the citizen in the center. Um, the project's designed to develop uh, several platforms and tools, uh, so it's, it's a very software-oriented project, but behind it all is, uh, are some uh, uh, some demos or, or prototypes that we want to launch to test out new ways of, of learning. And I'm going to say just a few words about, uh, about each of them. Uh, Virtual Atom Smasher, you can guess, is, is uh, very focused on CERN. But where does this, this project come from? Well, it comes from the, a, a discovery that one of the scientists, uh, theorists at CERN made. Uh, he had a 12-year-old intern one summer and didn't know what to do with the guy, so he asked him to uh, analyze some data uh, which involved tuning parameters uh, to, to, uh, to find out if they could uh, match uh, certain patterns of collisions by tuning these parameters in a simulation. Uh, so parameter tuning normally assumes that you understand what you're doing, but it turns out that actually you can tune the parameters without knowing deeply about the physics. It's a game, right? And the 12-year-old became very competent at the game, actually was better at tuning than the researcher after a few weeks. So this is uh, an example of how we want to get people involved, and it's very similar to a project called Folded in, in its concept, if, if you like, but we're trying to create open source tools so that, that other projects that fit this sort of pattern could be, uh, could be solved in this way. Uh, Geotag X uh, is a project from the UN Institute of Training and Research, uh, uh, and uh, what's going on here is um, uh, this is really uh, similar to, to the, the great projects from Zooniverse and, and to other projects that Ibercevis has, has been uh, uh, developing here, is uh, images that you get, in this case, many of them from the web or from people with phones, of certain situations, disaster situations, humanitarian problems, uh, getting people to classify these images. And uh, there's, there's a lot of great projects that, that focus on classification of images like this. What we focused on in GeotagX, though, is bringing in scientists to try and develop some kind of learning steps as you start to classify so that, for example, looking at dis destroyed buildings after a war uh, and helping engineers to decide to what extent that building needs to be repaired or maybe needs to be demolished requires some some deeper understanding of engineering. So we want to give uh, the volunteers a chance to, uh, to learn that in a structured way so they come out with, with some new knowledge about engineering. Uh, HeroCollie.com is a, is a game, uh, a game focused more of an edu edutainment type game. Uh, you are a nanobot and you're helping uh, a bacterium uh, to survive in a hostile environment 
uh, by snipping uh, and changing bits of DNA. Essentially, it's a, a game to learn about synthetic biology. It's from our colleagues in, in Paris, so it's a synthetic biology lab. And the idea is to take students through many of the steps that they need to understand uh, to, to get into hands-on uh, synthetic biology experiments, uh, similar to the iGEM competition, if you know that. Um, finally, uh, from our colleagues at UCL, Arctic ICT, uh, this is really focusing on working with communities uh, uh, in extreme conditions. So this is what uh, Muki Hakle, one of our partners, refers to as extreme citizen science. Uh, these, this is in the Alaskan Arctic, uh, uh, and these are local hunters who are struggling with the impact of climate change, how it affects their ability to hunt. So the idea is to give them mobile tools to actually record details about what happens as they struggle uh, with uh, changing patterns of sea ice melting and so on, uh, so that one gets details about wh how their, their environment are, uh, is, uh, is being modified. So to wrap up, and you know, because this is very short, I'd like to uh, 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 take uh, one of the uh, many very interesting insights we got from the interviews. This is my colleague, Laura Klitzer, at the University of Geneva, who did a lot of this. Uh, this is what one participant in a project said, by doing things a lot and maybe talking about them on the forum, you learn things. It's hard not to. Okay? Uh, in, buried in that simple sentence is something I think quite profound about learning because these are two types of learning. Learning by doing things right, and learning by talking about things with other people that are very different from the classroom learning we think of, where you receive learning from a teacher. Right? So I think the power of citizen science that we've only just begun to develop lies in this sentence that we already have the tools embedded in many citizen science projects to really help people learn uh, in, in a much more effective way. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Gina, please. Gina is going to present as the educational perspective. Please, question for Fran. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask a question. Right, yes. Um, Sarah Kendrick, yeah, you're from the University of Oxford. Uh, your identity box, you know, with your sort of motivations of what, um, you know, what people get out of doing citizen science, what, what kind of methods did you use to do that? I mean, what, did, you mentioned something about interviews, but what have you done to kind of study motivations or outcomes with users? So, so far, the, the, what you saw there is the synopsis, as it were, visual synopsis of a whole series of interviews with, with, uh, uh, with participants in different projects, uh, in a different variety of projects. Uh, so it's really an analysis of, uh, of these interviews and trying to figure out what are the main aspects, the, the recurring motifs uh, of those interviews. A general question. Are we going to have access to the presentations, the slides? And sure. It's, I think it's mandatory, right, if you are promoting openness. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm uh, Gina Mihai and on behalf of uh, European SchoolNet I will be presenting Scientix, the, the community for uh, science education in uh, Europe. So um, as I said, I'm a, project, a science project uh, officer at European SchoolNet, which is a network, um, uh, it's a non-profit organization, it's a network of uh, 31 Ministry of Education. Uh, from Europe and uh, beyond, uh, beyond, and aiming to uh, bring um, uh, innovation in uh, learning and teaching to its stakeholders. And we have uh, stakeholders, we have um, ministries of education, we have uh, schools, we have teachers, um, and also researchers, of course, and uh, industry partners. I'm involved in uh, many uh, projects uh, founded by European Commission, so we are working with many projects founded. Uh, but besides uh, the pro projects we are working with, uh, there are many other uh, uh, projects founded by European Commission. But uh, when those projects are finishing, uh, the information uh, um, get, get, get uh, lost 
Um, I mean, the website uh, is lost, and then uh, other teaching materials and other information about the projects are lost. So, scientists, uh, the idea of scientists was to um, to collect all this kind of information, general information, and also research information, teaching materials, information from different uh, projects, and put them together in order to have access uh, after the projects are finishing to to be them there on in scientific portal. Um, so that, um, that was the idea of uh, scientists. Um, as uh, scientific uh, uh, stakeholders, so uh, the exchange of information uh, in scientists is uh, is done between uh, the different stakeholders. Uh, on one side, we have the scientific teacher pa panels. We call them uh, scientific ambassadors and deputy ambassadors. We have uh, around 90 uh, uh, scientific ambassadors, and. Um, from all over Europe, um, they disseminate scientists in their countries. And the other side, we have uh, scientists' uh, national contact points, uh, who are uh, experts in uh, science in different uh, domains. Um, and um, uh, scientific activities which are connected to uh, uh, citizen science. So in scientists, we have uh, different different kind of activities which can be connected to citizen science. On one side, we have uh, the Citizen uh, uh, European Conference, which is taking place uh, actually next month. Uh, we are working very hard for that. Uh, we have in total 550 um, uh, teachers, we have researchers there, we have policy makers and uh, also uh, project managers. Um, on the other side we have also as a scientific uh, activity, uh, we have online forums. Uh, one of them uh, it was like uh, under the scientific community of practice, uh, uh, one of the was taking place uh, was running between 7 to 20 uh, of July, uh, and one of the topics was about uh, citizen science. Um, then, besides besides uh, the activities I mentioned before, we also have the projects uh, which are through the pro portal can be seen there, but uh, and. Uh, mm, Within the projects, we are uh, organizing uh, um, uh, different science projects, networking events for uh, project coordinators, for, for project managers. Um, and uh, so the idea is that we uh, bring them together to uh, share and exchange the information, the, their experience, exchange their ideas, and also to present their results uh, to other stakeholders. Um, and we already have organized two of them, uh, um, and uh, we, di we, uh, we have different topics. We have, uh, for example, we already had uh, the communication and dissemination, so uh, 14 projects were present at that time, and we already had this month another one. Uh, with uh, the topic was about uh, teacher training and European projects and uh, also policy recommendations for uh, teacher trainings. And uh, we will have another one in collaboration with uh, media and uh, learning, will be focused mainly on, uh, ma uh, on the social media. Uh, in case you would like to know more about scientists, you can get in contact with, with myself or uh, Agueda Gras, who is a scientist project manager, and uh, with the other colleagues of mine you can find the, their information over here. And you have, have any questions, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gina. Now it's time for Peter. Uh, and Luis. Hello, good morning. Um, I'd just like to introduce the ICT Art Connect study. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting us and to be present in, in this conference. Um, very basically, the, the ICT Art Connect study was launched by the uh, science, uh, the, the Digital Science Unit 
um, this year, and it's going to end up this year as well. And just because the Commission understood that there's a relationship between arts and ICT that can be fruitful for ICT. So this has to be very clear to everybody involved in this process, and I think it is already, that we're looking into the contributions of the arts or artistic practices to new ICT developments. And in this context, we were asked um, to evaluate, somehow map, but not just map, so, so I would say to quantify and qualify these emerging fields so we can be established as, as such. Uh, we are already in the midterm of, um, after midterm of the project, and we have some concrete results that we would like to share with you. And for that, I give the floor to Peter Jan. Okay. Thanks, Louis, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to briefly go in through our slides in order to have you have a good overview of what we're doing. Um, as I said, we're a consortium of uh, I minds from where I come from and uh, our chair where Lewis is uh, coming from. Uh, it's a very short period study, so we do uh, only one year uh, with a very bottom-up approach. We really want to have a very bottom-up approach from the people in the field uh, to our to our setup. Uh, as such, we decided that we needed a very good and very sufficient board. So we have, from the field, we have a lot of interesting people coming from major institutions in Europe that are in our board and having like two or three times a year, or sitting, or four times a year even, sitting with us together and giving feedback on what we do. Because we didn't just want to have like a research on something that was, that was in, started from a very academic point of view. No, we wanted to have really good input. And the best input, or at least the best connection we found out is to to have a, a board of people that is behind you and is able to basically um, disseminate the questions you want to share and disseminate all the um, data that you have at a certain point in order to get uh, some feedback from what people are doing or people are doing or g giving into. Uh, as such, we have a website which is um, ICD Art Connect. Uh, artconnect.eu, um, uh, in which we have an online survey, uh, an online survey which I'll go on a little bit deeper and the results as such. Uh, and of course, with this survey, we're trying to get as much as data as possible, but we also uh, like to do, make the opportunity to do lots of dissemination, and it's, that's why we're happy to be here as well. But uh, this weekend, we were doing a presentation in Bozar, and it's a perfect opportunity to invite you guys over for this weekend. It starts on Thursday evening. It's, a, um, it's in the framework of the Bozar Electronic Arts Festival uh, where you can see all these kind of really interesting uh, digital arts uh, projections uh, like the Pendle Choir. Uh, as such, for the rest, we've been doing research on these kind of uh, more digital uh, blended things like the Deaf Art Project, which was uh, broadcast in the Barbican, or uh, the people from Crew who work with these emerging camera systems. Uh, so uh, what, is, what, was, what we've been doing up for the last half a year, more like last half a year, is we having this survey online and offline. We're really trying to get as much data as possible in a very short time uh, from people that are in this gap between, like Louis said, art and ICT. We're not focusing on art for art or art just because as an expression. No, we wanted to go for what this artistic practice can mean to uh, have better and become more um, where ICT projects. So we've been combining both uh, interviews with open-ended questions and closed uh, multiple choice uh, questions. So it just it was very hard. We really wanted not just to map because like you see today, everybody is showing here the map, what they do with having all these institutions and all the people that are working on it. So we have a map as that as well. But we wanted, although we have a little less, um, little, little amount of time, we wanted to go more deeper into the data. So we started to go on, on, on uh, um, working very hard on the survey to really ask people how they feel and how they concern themselves within the ecosystem of art and ICT. Um, so the focus basically is, is by fall. We first be focusing on what the personality is. As such, these people are people with a very diverse background, people that are coming from uh, a lot of different institutions, people that live in different places, people that are very flexible in moving and working and doing different kinds of things. So we really wanted to go and see how the psychology of these people is working and how they um, move into Europe and out of Europe for different projects. 
Um, so we really wanted to first define in roles what people have, where people are doing, but then we th found out that it was very hard to define because a lot of these people don't really go into it. So we focused on what projects are, and that's what we've been doing on the map. So we have a map not only with the people that are into it, but also on the, on the, pro, on the projects, focus on what projects that people are having and doing. Uh, and then the third phase, and that was something that came out of uh, our discussions with the board, and that's why we think it's so interesting how to have a board as that, that the board found it was interesting as well to look at why certain uh, projects were successful, that we're trying to map the success rate and why some uh, projects were a failure in such a point and were successful in another point. And of course, the balance between what is the material outcome of ICT and the immaterial outcome, which is more linked to, uh, to art as such. So some results, I'm just going to briefly going to look good through with it so you have an idea of what we've been doing. Uh, the first part is like seeing what these people consider themselves. Are they linking themselves more to art or to research, the soft or the hard part, if you want to say, uh, as a method, art as a matter of approach rather than the creation of ICT or IT as a more instrumental thing. A lot of these things are related to academics, right? A lot of these people are, as you saw in the first graph, related to art or to academics. So you can definitely see that the majority of people of the project that were done are linked to academia, while the other are linked to art. Uh, a very nomadic life, when we start mapping on where people were living and how people were moving along in Europe, so that these people are very nomadic and that these pre projects as such are very nomadic. Uh, when we're looking at goals and drivers for these people, it's also very interesting that it's like half-half work, like working within the innovation and working to better uh, ICT rather than to go for the other part, people were focusing on art. Uh, what the context, again, it's a very uh, dual situation. Here again, research and exhibition, art and research uh, on both sides. Uh, the outcome, and then it's interesting when you start to see what's going to be material and immaterial, that some of it is done as research, while others more promotion and the others then more linked to the personal uh, showing of the of broadcasting of art as such. Uh, it's the success factors, what we're trying to basically blend and see what artists or what ICT people consider to be the project to be successful and what does it mean to be uh, successful. The reasoning behind it, why are people doing it and how are they relate to what's their emotional feeling towards the project that they're doing. Uh, so, just some brief conclusions. The sector uh, is widely spread around Europe, is highly educated, uh, is involved in a lot of projects, and it's engaged in a lot of societal and ecological issues. Uh, it's not only focused, and that's what's very important, that's what, what the outcome and the, the tension is between the whole art and the ICT thing. It's not only focused on the material outcome, but strongly engaged in immaterial outcomes as well, and putting itself between this void of art and ICT. Um, looking for, of course, looking for more collaboration and funding lines because it's also very interesting to see how they relate in European context. These projects are very diverse in setup and contents, are linked to academia, art, or by fault, somewhere in between. Uh, success is determined on a personal level, being artist or ICTE guy, or as on research as an outcome as such. Outcome is manageable in concrete outcome, but immaterial outcome is important as well. So that's a bit on the, the just a brief overview of what we've been doing and how we were trying to, uh, instead only not mapping all this information that we have, but also go a little bit deeper and digging into this void between art and ICT in order to see how we can uh, promote better uh, ICT research. Thank you very much. Yes, is there any question, Jan? Yeah. I just wondered how mutually... How mutually exclusive were the respondents? Because it seems to be, there seem to be two camps of the, the artists and the ICT people, but how many people were actually in both?
Well, uh, our next speaker, it's uh, Giuseppe. He's coming from, uh, uh, well, he's a brain major in Juris, I think, and uh, he's talk about. He's going to talk about the COFET project and uh, the FED 2020. Okay, good morning. Uh, well, we, we didn't run experiments in the COFED project of the FED 2020 initiative, so I'm, going, I'm not going to take much of your time. It was basically a small support action, a consultation activity uh, among the uh, stakeholders of the FED program, Future Emerging Technologies. Uh, so we organized uh, some conferences. Um, how do I? Sorry. <laughs> it's blocked. Uh, take this, please. Uh, yeah. Okay. It'll be it'll be easier. So we did uh, three conferences uh, uh, on innovation, outreach, and enlarging the community. I think the most important for for us to talk today is the one that we did in in Pisa in uh, in January on outreach. And I'm going to jump to the. Uh, sorry, <laughs> some of the conclusions. It wasn't the luckiest. Um, uh, conference because of floods in, in the area of Pisa, so we, we got stopped after one day. It was supposed to last two days. But we, we, we uh, uh, got to the conclusions from the Fed community. Uh, what should uh, Fed projects or even the European Commission do to enhance the uh, uh, communication outreach and um, involvement of, of uh, citizens by uh, Fed researchers? And uh, one advice that came from people taking, into, uh, taking part in the project was uh, we, we probably need a bit of engagement strategy at the beginning of the uh, project already at the proposal stage. So it might be useful actually to uh, ask people to, to reason in terms of what the strategy would be rather than uh, conventional dissemination uh, activities. And this links also to uh, what needs to be uh, done and delivered at the end of the project from the outreach perspective uh, because we uh, many people uh, said they were under pressure to uh, release deliverables and a lot of uh, usual outputs uh, based uh, work on how many uh, you know reports and press releases and, and uh, brochures you have done and uh, there was less focus on actually what uh, um, measures the engagement of, of people. So maybe we need to think about indicators of finding new ways of measuring that. Uh, another critical issue is uh, many scientists, young researchers, are just not trained to run outreach activities. They, they don't know how to uh, think or structure the engagement of people, run participatory uh, models in their research projects, and, and that's of course um, that hinders uh, the uh, outreach effectiveness of projects. And uh, last, uh, we found uh, that many projects were a bit more successful when the you know the the, the ground on which they were being being built, also in terms of the local constituency, not talking only of research people, but also. Uh, you know, local associations or citizen, citizen groups were already active there. So um, uh, there's a lot that is going on, and I'm sure that many of you are involved in that, uh, in Europe about creating new uh, associations of uh, citizens uh, that are dedicated to uh, participatory uh, science and involvement in research, and that probably is uh, a constituency that needs to be encouraged and, and fostered for the years to come to, to get uh, more readiness from society to uh, take up you know, active roles in, uh, in science projects. Uh, so I think that's, that's it. There were our conclusions, no experiments, so <laughs> questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question, oh, or comment, uh, rather. I, I really like those conclusions, uh, by the way. 
Um, but your comments about training uh, in, you know, engaging with public and outreach that should be part of, you know, young career, um, young scientists kind of career development and, and of their training. I think that's one aspect uh, and certainly in the UK you see, you know, there's a quite rapidly growing number of programs for providing that kind of training. But I think in parallel with that there also needs to be um, sort of a systemic recognition of that kind of work. There needs to be also the, a, an incentive that translates into career advancement for young scientists who actually get involved in that sort of thing, which I think at the moment is lacking. In the web paper, we are asking for that Any alternative recognition and assessment of scientific and educational curricula for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's Daniel presenting one of the projects. Good morning. Can you hear me well now? Thank you. So thanks to Karen Fabry, probably you know a bit better what is responsible research and innovation, but just to make sure uh, how many of you are familiar with this term before Karen intervention. Just to wake you up, could you raise your hands? Okay, that's, that's usual. <laughs> so for those working on citizen science, uh, usually it has involved researchers, science education community, and of course citizens. And now more and more it is involving industry, businesses, and policy makers, as, as the white paper that Fermin presented and this conference exemplify. So talking about citizen science can uh, come to mind terms such as those that I dropped there, co-creation, co-responsibility, and many more, just a few examples. But all make sense in terms of responsible research and innovation, or RRI. Because by definition, this, this idea, this new approach, just tries to get on board all stakeholders. And from the European Commission perspective, they usually talk about five or six key components. And some of them are really closely linked with citizen science, such as science education, open access, of course, and public engagement. But there is more, because uh, the new definitions that are evolving about RRI put the focus not only on the outcomes, but also on the process. The process of the research and innovation system has to be diverse, inclusive, open, anticipative, and so on. Many concepts that are indeed in citizen science. And of course, the outcomes. The outcomes have to be socially and ethically acceptable, uh, sustainable, which is closely linked with citizen science also, and some cases address some of the societal challenges that the European Union um, define. But there is more, because there is also a will to, as Francois was mentioning before, empower the public to participate better in the research and innovation dialogue. And also we want individuals and institutions to be responsible. So with all this overall picture, uh, how can we land this? How can we make it happen? And this is where ROI Tools stands, because we have a mandate to create tools and train on this toolkit to disseminate as widely as possible and to foster ROI all across Europe. And then it comes the second question that people usually ask us. And it's, well, what do you mean by tool? Uh, our project is started in January this year. It will run till the end of December 2016. And during these first months, we've been searching and we've been thinking what kind of tools would be helpful to foster our life. And they come from inspiring practices taken from different fields of RRI, including, of course, citizen science. 
to standards developed based on these inspiring practices, to self-assessment tools that help people to gauge their level of performance in their different aspects of RRI, and to guidelines on how to plan, implement, and implement improvements in these areas of RRI, to, of course, training, advocacy resources, dissemination tools, and Surprise, surprise, another community of practice. So there are tons, tons of communities of practice already there, and it's, as you already know, it's very challenging to keep them all alive. And because of this, and because of the variety of resources already there, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We, as scientists, and Gina mentioned before, we want to be an umbrella project just trying to collect all the efforts already there, all the resources, and make them available as easily as possible. We want, so we are collaborating with different initiatives in gender, ethics, open access, and so on, because sometimes, as Gina was mentioning, the, the hardest part is just getting to the resources. So with this in mind, uh, we are building this through a consortium of 26 members. And one of our stronger points, and also a headache in terms of coordination, is that uh, we are a big consortium with four networks covering civil society organizations, such as Living Knowledge, uh, the European School Net, uh, the European Business Network covering industries, and the European Foundation Center focused more on policy makers. And through these networks, and through 19 hubs, probably you may have identified partners in some of your projects. So these 19 hubs that cover 30 countries, we are trying to advocate and disseminate the, in the use of this RRI toolkit. So I would say um, let's just talk. Let's, uh, we can offer this to you. Um, this is uh, the RRI tools has been mentioned as a reference project for ongoing calls in the science with and for society calls uh, within Horizon 2020. But being such a wide scope project, we cannot dig very much into each of the specific aspects of RRI. So that's why we need all of you. And in particular in citizen science, we need you to tell us what you need to implement citizen science we need to make us aware of already existing tools for citizen science that we may have missed in our previous search. And we need to find with you ways of collaboration between your projects and our project. So I would say just, yeah, let's talk and let's join forces. Thank you very much. Any question before the coffee break? <laughs> or maybe later? Yeah, okay. Uh, just following the question about the slides, uh, just in, we will s spread in the website and by email to the people who is already registered. But in case any of anybody from of you didn't register, write your email here and we will send it later, okay? I leave this in that table, okay? Uh, so I think coffee is served out there. Thank you. 30 minutes later, we will see you.
Hello. I don't know if this computer is connected to the internet, but just for all of you, the white paper, you have to go subsentize.u, the portal page, and there is a section called policy recommendation, and it is the link to the section with the document, okay? So now it's turn for... Uh, we, we, we can show it later. Uh, it's time for the last session of presentations. Uh, I invite Victor Castello from the CSIC in Spain and the Science Ministry, an expert on infrastructure. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fermin. Good morning to everybody. Well, I, I have a, a short presentation about the Ibercibis. Ibercibis uh, uh, really is a, a pioneer initiative uh, related to, to citizen science. The, the idea of, uh, the, or the origin of the, of the Ibercibis comes from a, a successful uh, experience in, in the region of, of Zaragoza, the, the city of, of Zaragoza, that uh, was a, a Boeing, a Boeing uh, experience. But at, after that, uh, the University of Zaragoza, the leader of the, of the, of the CIBIS uh, initiative, was speaking with different uh, partners or possible partners in Spain related to this, to this kind of, uh, of uh, initiative. Uh, after several several months, we were speaking uh, with the ministry, with other research institutions, regional institutions, and finally, we, we uh, I think that it was in, in 2011, we organized uh, as legal entity a foundation where the partners are th this kind of, of uh, uh, stakeholders. The, the, the Ministry of, uh, uh, of Science, actually the Ministry of Economy and Competitiveness, uh, research institution. You have in the, in the flyer in, on, on the table, you have uh, here the, the, the different uh, partners of the, of the foundation. The, the SIC is my, my own institution, it's the, it's the Consejo Superior de Investigación Científica related with all kind of, of research, the CIEMAT the Spanish NREN, the Rediris, and, and also other uh, regional and, and uh, regional organizations, as Iber, Iker Basque and Gobierno de Aragón. No? And after, uh, uh, there are the, the civil society. I, uh, there is uh, some uh, uh, association related to, to, to research. Well, what is uh, our experience? Apart of the, the origin of the, and the, the difficulties or not to convince the, the different partners in order to be, uh, to see, uh, to, to, to be part of the, of the foundation, our experience, it has, was really not very difficult to convince uh, some of them. For, for example, in, in my case, in the, in the CSIC, it was very easy to uh, speak with the people of the communication of the science in the, in the, in the CSIC in order to convince them that this is a, a very uh, way to communicate the, the science. Uh, is very important for, for, uh, for, for the scientists to have the feedback of the society, of the, of the people in the... Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the citizens, and it's a uh, way to obtain a great impact in, a great impact in, in, the, in the media. No? Also, uh, as research using the, the Boeing, uh, for example, the, the, the Boeing uh, technic, techniques, uh, we are uh, around uh, 36,000 uh, th uh, volunteers. And this is the equivalent of 2.3 teraflops of, of, uh, for the calculation, for the, for the, for the point of uh, research for, for, for computing. No? This is 
important, but it's not the, 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 main, the main goal of this, uh, of this uh, point. Because the, I think that the, the main, the main uh, the, the great impact of, the, of this uh, kind of things is the, the feedback from the, from the citizens. Uh, we have, uh, in our experience, we have uh, observed that there is uh, uh, some problems in order to um, the effort to, to migrate, to, to adapt the, the application or the, or the scientists to, to Boeing, uh, in the case of, of, of Boeing, uh, because uh, it's, it's difficult to, to do it or requires some, some, some efforts, but there are people, there are scientists that are using supercomputing in Barcelona Supercomputing Center or or other local local resources, but they are using also the the the, the Iberthibis, uh, uh, resource. Uh, also, actually, with the new applications uh, using mobiles, it, this is also uh, there is also uh, there is, is, is a challenge for researchers to adapt the 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 the, the applications for the new tools. This is a, a way to. To do it, uh, but uh, Ibercibis uh, start from from Zaragoza. After we go to to the foundation of Cibis in, in Spain, but uh, the the extension of Ibercibis was the natural extension to Portugal. We have a, a very uh, collaboration with with Portugal. Uh, there are several projects in in Portugal working, and the infrastructure that we are using uh, in the I am speaking of the Boeing. Or the Boeing uh, infrastructure is uh, is an infrastructure uh, common for the for the experiments uh, coming from Portugal that, that in Spain and we have a distributed system with servers in for the scientists for the for the for the all, all kind of all, all kind of uh, needs of the of the project. No? Also in in Argentina, in Peru, in Brazil, we have a, a very good con contacts. And uh, from the point of view of the, uh, the participation, we are also in, in, in directly or indirectly uh, working in several European projects. Societa so, 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 so is one of them. Uh, there is a, 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 only a, a key point that I, I want to, to, to finally to say is that from the point of view of to, to take the, the, this kind of things, uh, this kind of, of uh, resources as an infrastructure. I am working in the in several in several group in the ERG, uh, but I think that there is no uh, until now there is a, 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 we need to 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 uh, to convince this kind of uh, forums in order to to use uh, this kind of uh, infrastructures like one e infrastructure like other new infrastructure. Uh, perhaps the people working there is more uh, dedicated to high performance computing or grid uh, and we need to convince them there are some some uh, references uh, some people working on in this area in the in, in this group but we need to reinforce to 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 foster the communication in order to convince them no? the way uh, to do it uh, perhaps this is one of the uh, two points is to uh, to speak with the executive boards of these uh, forums and uh, to contact with the with the national uh, delegates uh, in, in this in these two forums and uh, well uh, all the the information that you need uh, is here and in the web of, uh, of the archivers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. Any question? Or... Now it's time to Claudia, who is going to present the European Citizen Science Association. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Um, I'm Claudia Goebel, coming from the Natural History Museum in Berlin, and I want to give you um, a very brief overview of the European Citizen Science Association, EXA. Um, um, EXA is united by the motto to advance and promote citizen science in a Europe where citizens are valued as a key component in advancing knowledge, um, about the sustainable development of our world. And this commitment to sustainable development stems from the experience of EXA members. Um, and this is kind of bottom up. EXA is a network of um, citizen science um, communities, initiatives, 
um, universities, research centers, and science and research museums from more than 10 countries um, across the European Union. And by now we have a very strong and also broad um, experience in environmental monitoring and sustainability research, which is one of the core focuses of EXA. Um, I think this will, while this re will remain the case, we are also looking to other areas um, in which citizen science are prospering and will prosper in the future in order to extend yeah, our membership into new directions as well. Um, EXA is administered by a secretariat, this is where I work, which is hosted at the Museum of Natural History in Berlin. And um, the, the director of which, Professor Johannes Vogel, um, who is currently also serving as the first chairman of EXA, um, extends his warmest regards to all of you here. He wanted to be here with us, but due to the change of dates, um, he was hold, uh, held in Berlin by another very important commitment. Um, so his best regards. With this, um, um, I'm going over to talk about the aims and aspirations of EXA. Um, I think they can be grouped like in three broad categories. One is um, fostering citizen science. Um, and that means, first of all, to support the growth of national citizen science communities. Yeah? To um, identify best practices there, um, to develop them further, and also then to promote excellence in these national communities. Um, but also it means um, for EXA, I think it's very important to promote a common European approach to citizen science. Um, and this is true in, in terms of methodology, um, education and training materials, and also standards referring to time and participation, because it is another important goal of EXA to engage with disadvantaged communities more strongly. Um, the next big aim is to foster cooperation, not only um, to strengthen national capacities, um, but also to work together across boundaries. Um, this very directly by sharing knowledge and um, skills and thus promoting a learning process among different groups active in citizen science, but also by promoting EU-wide citizen science programs and learning together by working together directly in projects. Um, and of course, um, we also want to link closer to the growing international citizen science community. And thirdly, um, which is um, also a very important point um, that so far has already um, al always slipped a little bit by the ground, but we're going to make it um, much stronger right now, to advance research. And this is on the one hand research on citizen science um, to cover some of the topics we've discussed also earlier um, this morning, um, and also to advance research through citizen science in order to take up some of the ideas behind um, responsible research and innovation and the European research area. Um, yeah, so if we think about all these aims, then um, it's clear that much work is still to be done and lies ahead of us, and this is why I would very much um, actually invite you to um, join EXA. Um, please come to the General Assembly that we are going to hold the 26th of November in Berlin. Um, register, um, sub register to the newsletter and please don't be um, put off by the website we are currently having. It's all work in, 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 in progress. We are currently finalizing the institutionalization um, of the association we have in, in spring, we have started to register at, um, as a non-profit association under German law. This is now finished, but still we are going to have this general assembly to finalize it. Um, we've started to apply for funding and um, yeah, meanwhile committees are working on some of the content issues that um, I've talked about it before. Please join us. We are very much looking forward to your contributions, to your feedback um, and to working with you. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, do you see your organization as kind of representing more the community of citizen scientists or the research community? I think it is specifically the aim to, um, to bridge this or to bring this together. I've just come from a, a workshop from the launching of the German um, initiatives. There is also um, um, a, a thing specifically for Germany. And we've also there, and, and also here, I think we always find this, that there are two poles, yeah? some kind of strong bottom-up projects that are coming. And on the other hand, um, and I mean, I'm working at the Natural History Museum, we have this, there are institutions that have been um, doing citizen science or engagement projects and have a long history of that. 
that. And I think it's um, exactly what, what is so strong about EXA, that we can actually combine this and bring these groups together and um, yeah, have a dialogue and try to link it and link it to the um, current policy questions as well. Mm -hmm. Congratulations for the work, and uh, Peter from the Open Knowledge Foundation from Gantt. Now it works? Yes. Hi everyone, I'm from the Open Knowledge Foundation. Uh, we are an international organization, that means that we have uh, we have some people who who tell us things from from the UK and from from elsewhere in the world, and uh, I personally I'm active in Open Knowledge Foundation Belgium. So um, I've been asked to uh, tell you something about citizen science. Probably you know way more about it than than I do. Uh, but the first thing I thought when when uh, when hearing about about everything that was going on, I thought I have to tell you something about the people who are active. Uh, within open knowledge. So uh, first, let's start with myself. Uh, I'm mainly interested by open transport. That means that um, I personally, I, I try to, I try to change the world by 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 getting people to 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 uh, to uh, build new apps about transport. Uh, but before they can actually build these apps, they have to get access to the data of the transport. Uh, so. What we really are is that, that, that in, in our organization, we try just with, with volunteers, people who are interested in the matter, to actually uh, make a difference by creating apps, opening up data, and so on. And this is not much different for Ben. Uh, ben Albershausen is, is, uh, uh, is the working group lead of uh, OpenStreetMap Belgium. And he's also just a volunteer. He has a normal job in GIS and, and, and so on. Um, but in his spare time, he he, uh, he does things with OpenStreetMap. Without him, there wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to actually uh, calculate a route using OpenStreetMap on uh, in Brussels, for instance, because that's that's the guy that that organizes meetups in Belgium and tries to do uh, tries to tries to engage the community. And that not not much different for uh, Raf. Raf Beul is, uh, is is a guy that that's active within our community. Uh, and um, he's, he's uh, a specialist in, in e-government, but in his spare time he has a strong interest in tourism data. So uh, you can imagine that Belgium, one of the most beautiful uh, countries to visit in your spare time, <laughs> uh, that, that you want to visit Ghent or Bruges, well, this guy uh, thinks like, hey, but these data sets are not interoperable, uh, how, come, how come that we cannot just use one app to visit the entire Belgium. You have to visit a lot. You have to uh, download a lot of apps. Well, this guy feels this this kind of frustration, and he tries to do something about it. And that's just in his spare time. He does that voluntarily. Same thing with Inge. Inge is is leading Open Access Belgium, and she's uh, she's doing everything in her spare time. She's a, she's a scientist at University Ghent, um, or Ghent University, and. Um, she, tr she feels the pain that she cannot access all the research papers at all time. So what does she do? She starts Open Access Belgium. Now it's, uh, it's uh, going, to, uh, going to be part of Open Knowledge Foundation Belgium. And uh, she, with, a, with a group of uh, volunteers, she tries to, she tries to change the, 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 the current policy and tries to uh, get more papers open, uh, openly available or accessible. Same thing with Yannick. This is the last one, I promise. Uh, <laughs> uh, Yannick is, um, uh, uh, is, is a, legal, uh, a legal expert. He works at Poppent, but in his spare time, he's really interested in licenses. Why? Because, well, right now, if you create a creative work, you can, uh, uh, there's, there's a copyright on it, and no one else can do something with it. Well, he translated the Creative Commons uh, licenses towards Belgian legislation in both Dutch and French. He cannot do that on his own, so he, he is trying to guide a group of volunteers, again, to actually create the tools for people to uh, create open content. And many more. We, we have more people like, like this. But I, I, I really like that, that, that Open Knowledge Foundation Belgium is just a not-for-profit organization which gathers all like-minded people who are interested in creating bottom-up grassroots, uh, grassroots uh, things. And it's, it's 
something I've been working on right now on um, about three years. We, we've, uh, we founded, officially founded our not-for-profit organization in 2012. Uh, and, and we found that it's really difficult to find, to find the right funding. Okay, you're working with volunteers, but you still need to, to find the right funding to, to, to do some management and to, do, to get everyone together, to, to have the right management. And, uh, because, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not easy to, to guide volunteers, people who, who, who just do stuff in their free time. So, um, so we have hired Pitrian. Pitrian is our full-time community manager. Manager, it's our own, uh, only uh, um, uh, yeah, full-time employee right now. But he does a great job, just uh, just uh, gathering everyone and try to get the noses in the same direction. So you might ask yourself, how are we funded? Well, we have uh, two things. One, we have our Open Belgium conference. You're all invited to, to Namur next year in, in February, where we have our uh, Open Belgium conference. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a conference where we gather really all, the, 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 all these people that, that I've mentioned and more. They are going to be there and they are going to host the session. They're going to host a discussion about all the issues that they're most interested in. So we are not going to invite, uh, invite uh, big policy makers or uh, big people. No, we are really going to invite only the, 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 the people who, who, who carry it at their heart, that really want to, uh, want to make a difference in the world. And that, that that's always brings a very, uh, very nice uh, discussion. Then the next thing we do is, um, oh yeah, we, we ask money for attending the conference, so that's how we, uh, we earn a bit of money to, to actually hire Patreon. And then we have uh, our Open Summer of Code, and that's a three-week event that we do uh, each, uh, each year, already since 2011. And uh, that's where we hire students. We pay them 10 euro per hour. And um, they are working on a proof of concept for a certain partner. So each year we work with uh, four or five partners um, that actually uh, sponsors, uh, sponsor us or give us a budget to create a proof of concept for, for something. And we, as Open Knowledge Foundation Belgium, we try to, uh, to guide these uh, students to actually do, um, uh, do open data or use, uh, reuse uh, open data and to use uh, open source projects and to also open up their code that, they, that they've written. So that's how we try to engage these students inside the open data community and inside the open source community. Then finally, we also have a European project, Apps for Europe. It's, um, uh, it's an FP7 CIP uh, project that we've joined. Uh, we're pr a, pretty, a pretty young organization, but we've been able to, to join that thanks to some great partners. Uh, and then we have a Flemish innovation grant for, uh, to, to actually create uh, a proof of concept for uh, irel.be, which is uh, the, the site where you can get uh, public transport information in a non-official way uh, right now, today. So uh, that's kind, kind of it. We want more funding like any other organization. So if you, if you have uh, funding opportunities, let me know. And we needed to actually empower the community, which is kind of weird because we never got funding right straight ahead from that. We always had to, had to find funding through projects we, we would do or through other, uh, other things. But what we really need money for is to just uh, get our community going. And that's, that's the most difficult part. Thank you. Now it's time for Eves, please. Any question for Peter? Nope. Yeah, like this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Yves Bernard from Brussels, so living just nearby along the canal. Um, and I'm the director of IMAL, a center for art and technology in Brussels, which exists since, uh, well, 2000. Um, we do a lot of things. Um, and I'm going to try to uh, explain you how we are going from an art science center to more something like uh, citizen science, 
well, that's what we would like to do. So uh, we do a lot of things, uh, exhibition, uh, a lot of conferences, uh, public events around uh, digital art, media art, uh, art and science, uh, with a lot of speakers. Uh, so it's really an art center, but oriented to contemporary art with today technology. It's an education center. We do a lot of workshops. Uh, it's a laboratory for artists, uh, for art science technology. Um, we produce a lot of work, and it's uh, indeed a, a European and international hub uh, here in Brussels. Um, so it's, it's uh, a unique integration of an art center, a media lab, a fab lab since two years, and a hub with transdisciplinary activities between art science and innovation. Uh, so uh, we already did a lot of projects uh, of art science projects. Um, and indeed, artists uh, are now recognized. Uh, it's quite clear now that they are a um, good catalyst for participating in a science project. And so they are among the first citizens now recognized as important for science and technology. Uh, so we, we worked in different uh, R&D projects. So, for instance, a project funded by Agence Nationale de la Recherche uh, in France. Um, we worked also uh, with artists participating in the Art and D program of iMind. Um, and we have uh, quite dense programs of uh, activities where we try to um, meet different kinds of public to connect different communities, artists, scientists, thinkers, hackers, creative people, curious and amateurs. So I'm just going to insist on one of them, which is our series of art science lecture uh, that we do well since 2007, I think, where we invite usually uh, either a, an artist who's used to collaborate with scientific or a scientist who used to collaborate with artists. So here you see some of the people we have invited um, yeah, and uh, um, well, we opened up uh, a fab lab in, in 2012, and indeed um, we did it because uh, we see that clearly uh, we have to go to evolve from a pure art center, uh, much more like something like a social innovation center that is not only um, limited to art and culture, but to all aspects of social innovation with uh, new technology. Um, and one of the reasons is indeed because our world is completely uh, defined by technology today, and the social and cultural life of people is defined by technology. And so the, we think that really people have to engage in the development of science and technology. Uh, so the Fab Lab for us is it's indeed an instrument to open our activities to uh, other fields than just art and culture, uh, and also to go to this citizen science movement. Uh, so it's, I suppose you, you know, everybody knows what is a Fab Lab, but it's a, an open workplace with uh, digital fabrication machines and also standard uh, tools, and it's open to anybody. Uh, to all citizens in uh, the neighborhood. So it's, uh, it allows uh, for uh, a lot of people and kids mainly to learn science and technology by making, uh, and also by studying the digital fabrication machines. So these machines indeed integrate a lot of things from uh, uh, physics, material science, uh, electronics, uh, computer science, and so on. Um, and it gives tools to people to build their own instrument, maybe sometimes some measurement instruments, some scientific instrument, um, and it raises the implication of citizens in the development of science and technology. Uh, that is, it shows them that indeed uh, technology is accessible, can be understood, can be um, uh, modified maybe, they can play, they can appropriate it, and they can, do, they can do things with it, and they can see that it's also fun and creative. Um, so, for instance, this is the kind of workshop we do for primary schools in uh, Molenbeek. So Molenbeek, it's, uh, diff well, 
um, has a bad reputation as a difficult area here in Brussels, uh, and that's where we are. Uh, but we really try to engage the population, the local population, the young people, and um, the Fab Lab, and it's really opened their minds in incredible ways. Um, we also do a lot of uh, workshop uh, for uh, different art schools here in Brussels, um, and uh, uh, and we do also some um, um, activities like this. Uh, uh, special workshops, uh, which was Toys Revival, and which was for different, again, this was for secondary school, and for the Scientothèque, it's a group at uh, the University of Brussels, it's an organization, it's like a library for science, uh, where you can borrow, uh, for instance, uh, uh, devices for making science experiments, and where there is a permanent exhibition, and so on. Um, and you see some of the things which have been produced during this uh, three months workshop. Um, so we think that after artists, all class of citizens should be in development of science and technology. And Fab Lab Imal is clearly one of the instruments for citizen science. We are quite new to citizen science, and of course we are open to collaboration with you. This is just a beginning. We need, of course, money to go along that, and we, that we hope that the European Regional Development Fund will help us to set up a, a big art science, citizen science center here in Brussels. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> okay, you are all happy here. <laughs> Now, I am afraid I have to apologize to Dri Hermand, who is in Manchester. Uh, he's the director of the Future Everything Festival, engaged with Sosentais, and he cannot present their work. It's a pity because it's a very interesting uh, scenario with deep impact in the city of Manchester. So let's, last and not least, of course, one of the largest projects of the citizen science in the world, Suniverse and Sarah, please. That one. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks very much for uh, giving us the chance to speak. I'm Sarah Kendrew. I'm at the University of Oxford. Uh, I should. I'm going to talk to you about uh, about the Zooniverse organisation. I'm here to represent them, though. Uh, I'll say upfront that I'm. Um, uh, I'm an astronomer. I don't actually work officially for the Zooniverse. I am here very much as a scientist who uses citizen science data for my own research. But I've been quite closely involved with the development of the project I work on, so I will show you a little what, uh, what Zooniverse is about and what uh, you know, the focus that they're taking. So if you don't know, Zooniverse started off um, with a project called Galaxy Zoo. Uh, which was created by a PhD student who, for his research, had to uh, look at uh, thousands and thousands of images of galaxies and answer very simple questions about them, and uh, decided that this was uh, probably a better way of doing it, so enlisted uh, volunteers, essentially, to do this for him on the internet. Uh, Galaxy Zoo became incredibly popular, had lots of users. They had some exciting discoveries um, by the users themselves and had a very active user community. And um, the kind of that initiative sort of grew and grew, and uh, today um, Galaxy Zoo still runs and is run by this organisation called the Zooniverse. Uh, they run something of the order of about 20 citizen science projects. Some get retired, others get created all the time. Uh, and the group is based uh, between Oxford University in the as, as part of the astrophysics department, uh, and also at the Adler Planetarium, which is in Chicago. And uh, the man uh, who, who, who leads uh, this whole group is called Chris Lintott, who's also based at Oxford with us. And the projects today really span everything from astrophysics uh, and different parts of astrophysics to um, looking at animals as you know, bat detective. We have projects on looking at cancer cells, um, climate change type projects. So there really is a huge range of projects and they work with a very diverse group of scientists and also people in the humanities. 
Um, I think some things that Zooniverse did very well from very early on is that they had very strong sort of ethical framework for the projects that they run. And one of the big, uh, folk, one of the big points was that the projects had to do real science. It was clear that this was not a public engagement exercise with showing people nice pictures. This had to answer very specific scientific questions. Um, and, and another big principle was not to waste people's time. I mean, you know, people, we all know our time is quite valuable. We don't want uh, to be telling people they're doing science when actually, you know, it, they're, they're not. So that was always a very kind of strong founding principle. They also uh, invested heavily in the technical, uh, the technical aspect of the project. So uh, hired good technical people and invested lots in the uh, sort of the front end and the back end development of the, of the project's framework. Um, and now Zooniverse has grown massively. Uh, in February, they crossed the sort of one million users threshold, which was huge. We have uh, users from all over the world and have this, you know, everything is kind of based around this beautiful web page. They have a very beautiful user interface. Um, here you can see there's been lots of media attention. So uh, you can also see that the, the kind of the trend of the, the growth in, in users and you see all these spikes which usually coincides with a project being uh, featured on a TV program or things like that. Chris Lintot is very kind of engaged with the media in the UK. Um, and so scalability has been a really big uh, issue as well and something that Zooniverse have invested in a lot over the years uh, and, and from, very, from the very earliest uh, days. They have lots of beautiful visualizations on, the internet, on, on their web page that you know, I'd invite you to have a look at. But as you can see, users are distributed really uh, you know, very globally. And um, by really investing in this infrastructure, they've been able to kind of cope with huge levels of traffic. I was going to talk a little bit in, in more detail about my own, about, you know, as an example of the project that I've been involved in. Uh, there's not a huge amount of time, so I'll, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, it's a project called Milky Way Project where we ask users to find um, certain objects and specifically bubble shapes in images and these, these beautiful images are from a, a, a telescope in space called the Spitzer Space Telescope which is a NASA project and this images the uh, images and infrared wavelengths and in these particular images we're looking at the plane of our galaxy so our galaxy is a disk and uh, we you know we're somewhere kind of south you know if you're looking at it this way, um, kind of south, south of the center of the galaxy. And so we're, these images are looking through the plane of our galaxy. So we're looking through a very, very sort of dense collection of, of gas and dust. Uh, and so this is where most of the stars form in our galaxy. And so we're asking people to find, yeah, this is just a little cartoon of how stars form. Essentially, when very massive stars form, you sort of get this creation of this bubble in the gas and dust in the galaxy. And that's what we're asking people to look for. So we have this beautiful interface where we ask people to draw ellipses on uh, ellipse shapes on the um, on, on the images to identify where these bubbles are, and then we had something like 50,000 users. We've had over well over a million individual bubble drawings, and then from that we've kind of created a new catalogue. And where there were only about a few hundred known before, we now know of sort of 5,000 of these um, 5,000 of these objects. And what, what I've then been doing for my research um, is that basically you can start studying things that, um, are on, on truly galactic scale. So rather than look at individual places where stars form in the galaxy, you can study how this works on the whole galaxy. Um, again, we've developed, um, when I say we, it's the clever technical people at Zooniverse, have created some really beautiful like visualization tools which users can see where you can really see the sort of classification uh, process um, to the users. So you have these sort of images where you see all the individual drawings and then you can show to people how those were merged together to form you know, the actual objects that ended up in the catalog. So I guess the message there is that the citizen science, the data, the raw data that we get is actually an incredibly kind of powerful learning tool as well. And that's something that's you know, taken very seriously. Uh, in the future, a big, uh, a big um, kind of avenue for research in the future is also how to, how to best use your crowd contributions. So of course, ideally, we would like to be able to do everything via algorithm uh, and with computers, um, because you can just you know, set your computer to do these sorts of classification tasks for you. Uh, but with, there's a lot of research going on into um, using the citizen science uh, information that we get to train clever machine learning algorithms uh, and to make our computers better. And certainly in astrophysics, we were facing an absolute 
gigantic volume of data from our future facilities. Um, and, and so this is a very kind of important area of research for us as a field, not just for Zooniverse. Uh, last year, this is a bit about uh, what, what Zooniverse is now doing for the future. Um, last year, they received a, a multi-million grant from, uh, from Google. And up until now, essentially, uh, the number of projects that Zooniverse run is kind of limited by the resources that Zooniverse have. So projects are still curated by Zooniverse. Uh, and they work together with the sort of relevant science teams around the community. Um, with this money from Google, they've hired uh, quite a few new technical people uh, in Oxford to kind of create a sort of content management system for citizen science. So rather than that our technical people create the projects from scratch every time, um, we want to create a kind of a, a, a toolbox that science teams can get that they can actually just do this themselves and have this beautiful interface that they can then customize according to the needs of their particular research area. So that's very much kind of the, the, the avenue for the future for Zooniverse. And so the group has grown massively with this new injection of cash. And it's a sort of a slightly different um, philosophy towards the future, as you, as you wish. Uh, this is just to show the latest project. Uh, you know, there's now a project to classify uh, penguins, which is a sure, surefire winner, obviously, because everyone loves penguins. Um, and then I just wanted to finish off by just showing, I hope, this is just an example of, again, the Milky Way project, just kind of a little video that's been recorded to kind of show how this works. Thanks. citizen science project is how you validate the, the data coming from and, and, and observations and the interpretations coming from, from the citizens. How, how have you been doing that in terms that you are so keen in, in the scientific results? Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good question. Uh, and one thing I think that we learned from Milky Way project is that um, you get so many raw classifications from your users is that uh, you have to really think very carefully about how you're going to calibrate the information that you get. Um, and people do, you can put in test images, uh, you basically have to try and sort of calibrate your users. Um, so um, you can test for certain biases uh, in, in classifications, uh, you have to think very carefully about that when you design the project, it's something that, something that I have really realized. Um, I know other, pro other subsequent astrophysical projects, uh, there was, for example, one which um, asked people to identify star clusters in uh, the Andromeda galaxy, which is you know, our nearest big galaxy. Um, and they actually, uh, they inserted fake clusters, you know, and if, if people, and, but they were really obvious, but they weren't, you know, actually there. So if certain users didn't identify the fake clusters, which were glaringly obvious, then you, you know that maybe they're not doing a very good job. Um, with the rest. So you can, you can do all kinds of things with the data um, that will then help you calibrate and, and help you kind of, um, you know, create a kind of good data pipeline. So, I mean, are you using automatic, automatic uh, analysis methods, data mining methods on the data oh, just, yeah. to, just to sort out if you have outliers and things like that? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is the very first stage of that whole kind of data analysis process. Every project has a kind of data reduction pipeline um, where you, um, where usually it's things like, certainly for, for Milky Way project, it's, it's basically sort of advanced clustering algorithms where you find classifications that are close to each other in space and with similar properties. And so it's all, yeah, it's all a lot of sort of machine learning type, type things, yeah. Uh, I'd like to know whether the project you're working on and more generally, the projects in the Zooniverse uh, uh, overall project uh, are designed with having in mind that citizens will participate, or whether you have a scientific project to start with, and then all of a sudden you realize that you can be helped uh, in your project by citizens' participation. Um. Yeah, that's another good question. Um, I think because essentially this is quite new, um, 
I don't, I don't know the year that the original Galaxy Zoo launched, actually, but it's, you know, say of the order of five or six years or so. Um, I think nearly all the projects that we have in there currently are very much of the second kind, where people have faced this problem for a while with their data and then decide that actually this is a good way of, of doing it. Um, but it's, I think it's something certainly that I'm very interested in towards the future, whether you could actually set up your experiment um, that, such that your data will be you know, automatically fed into a citizen science project. And certainly citizen science uh, has become a much more high profile topic of discussion for facilities like the Square Kilometre Array and the, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which are a sort of next generation uh, astronomical observatories that will produce, you know, kind of tens of terabytes of data each night. Yeah. For, the, for the LSST, just to give you an idea, I think in uh, the, the LSST, in, in, in something like its first year, it will produce more data than we have on the, in the entire internet today. And it's estimated that about 90% of the data will never be seen by humans because it will just be, yeah, that the data volume is so enormous. So I know that certainly there are things like machine learning, but also citizen participation in classification of data will become, is becoming much more important. Uh, good morning. My name is Bardella Thar. I'm uh, with the Open Geospatial Consortium and project member of COBWEB, which is a citizen science project for biological monitoring. A uh, question for you, maybe for all the others as well, a topic that hasn't been or hasn't been specifically addressed this morning, is when citizens contribute, do they contribute as anonymously or do they contribute by giving their user credentials? And then if they do, how do we manage that privacy? I think that's an important aspect that, you know, specifically in, in COBA, we, we try to deal with according to EC privacy laws, which turned out to be harder than, than expected. Um, so I'm interested to learn from everyone around the table here how they deal, A, with the privacy aspect when observations are contributed not anonymously, and then, two, you know, how do you disseminate that information keeping that privacy law uh, in mind? Thank you. Uh, certainly for being a, a participant in Zooniverse, um, I think the requirements are quite minimal and I think again that's something that we realised uh, was, was quite important. So it's just a name and an email address I think. Uh, we, we have a sort of, Zooniverse has a sort of open policy, uh, I think that we don't give their data to anybody else and we only use their data for communication relevant to what they are doing. Um, nobody likes spam. And um, users have gotten involved in research. You know, there have been cases where users have flagged things up on the forum that, that has then resulted in follow-up observations or a scientific paper. But I think, again, then Zooniverse will always contact them to ask them if they, you know, to make sure that they kind of consent to being involved in that way and if they are interested in doing that. But I appreciate that some that there's a lot of scope for citizen science projects where, you know, maybe health related or medical related where things like data protection are much more important, yeah. I'm interested about the citizen science uh, project's uh, content man management system. Uh, how do you deal with the different nature of the projects? And also, I don't know if you have heard about Fibosa, but it might be helpful because it's something similar. Can you repeat the name of the... Uh... Uh, by Bosa. I think uh, Francois can tell you more about that. Okay. Um, as for the different nature of the projects, uh, I think one, one thing that, that, you, that, that they found, that the Zooniverse developers have found, that actually a, a, lot, of the, a lot of projects share a lot of commonality. So we, there has been uh, sound data, image data, video data, but um, in a sense, uh, you know, it, they've created a kind of, uh, kind of flexible framework where the data you put in is an asset and an asset has, and this is all defined in software and computer science, you know, has, um, you know, has certain attributes. And essentially every interface, again, has a lot of common features. Sometimes you draw, sometimes you just click. But again, so I think the focus is really on providing that the back-end back system 
and providing the interface tools so that the scientists themselves can, you know, there's a sort of basic framework for the front end, but that they can then integrate whatever drawing tools or click tools or whatever uh, as they see fit. Of course, it, you know, you'll never be able to please everybody and it won't work for some people, but the idea is to make it a kind of a very flexible um, toolbox for scientists. How are you crediting citizen authorship in research papers? How are we creating the... Ah, yeah, again, um, there's a sort of policy that the users of Zooniverse will be referred to as collaborators. Um, we don't, you know, we want to really acknowledge people's contribution. Um, I think very quickly the number became too big to acknowledge them all by name in the paper. Uh, some users have ended up on author lists, though, because, you know, like what I mentioned before, we've had users who've identified interesting things, and they have then, we've given them the option of actually being co-authors on the papers. Um, and there is a statement in acknowledgements about, you know, acknowledging the uh, contributions of all the users, basically. A bit of a theoretical question that I think relevant to citizens' observatories. What if uh, uh, a citizen that observed, you know, something in the domain you're working in revokes his observation, says, I no longer, you know, want to contribute my observation, I want to redraw it, what happens? Have, have you ever dealt with that question? I mean, I think... Yeah, I, I know it's sort of... um, with Zooniverse, I think, I think the key to the answer to your question is that with Zooniverse, the users don't contribute their own... Their, they don't send us any data. So they provide clicks and they provide us with their interpretation of what we're seeing in the images or video or whatever. Um, and yes, sometimes you get it wrong. I'm a Zooniverse user, right? You know, sometimes you, your cat jumps on the keyboard. Uh, so sometimes you provide the wrong data. That is true. But the idea is that uh, no, you know, we use statistics. We get millions of classifications in a project. So one piece of wrong information doesn't, doesn't really make a difference. We, we work with statistics rather than individual uh, bits of information. Um, as for the sorts of projects that we've, you know, others have talked about today with, uh, you know, kind of citizen observatories and things like that, I think obviously that becomes a more important issue where people have maybe got their smartphones linked up to your servers and, you know, that... Get <coughs> Actually, legally they own the observation whether it's a click or they draw a rectangle or it's, you know, whatever they do in Galaxy Zoo, they intellectually own that. And so you... Is, is there any... Can well, we... Please let, let me pass the word to the rest of the audience, okay? Well, I mean... It's like I said, because I'm just sort of more a science user of the information rather than creating the whole framework myself. But as far as I can tell, if a user wants to delete their account, they should, I think, because there is, there, you know, they have very centralized database servers, I think there is no reason that you can't delete everything a user has ever contributed. Um, Whether that's ever happened? Whether that's ever happened, <laughs> I have no idea. No, I, I think you, you just said what I was going to say. I think you, you can always extract that, um, but I'm, I would contest what you've said. I don't think uh, one, every click you own on the web. Um, as part of the citizens of right. So is that a kind of... Uh, a sort of code of, is that like a code of practice or is that really law? I can only say for the project that I'm working in in COVID when an, a citizen scientist takes an observation that he legally owns the observation. That is European law. And whether that is a click, well, that is debatable maybe, mm -hmm. uh, but he owns the observation. More questions, other issues? We are on debate time. We 
Yes, sir, you are constant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any comment? I follow one of the comments before about the, um, the point of view of the researcher. If they are designing the, pros the projects, having in mind the power of of the, the crowd or not, I think it's a key question for the educational environments to, I, I think it's coming already, that researchers are becoming aware that they have to leverage the full potential of the people. And they, they have to, the same, working on infrastructure, the same, you don't do the same program for a great computing platform or a supercomputing platform. Now we have the, super, the whole society as a new platform. But there are two questions there. Not only uh, how do I take the most of the people, but also to be aware that uh, you have to design with real people and they have real concerns and, uh, and think what do they gain when they collaborate with us. There are different models of participation. It's not the same in educational projects that in, in Open Knowledge uh, Foundation. Uh, the passion and the, the, the motivation is, are totally different. So the researcher must think, uh, who are my target uh, collaborators and what do they think about me? Also, involve them from the beer level. But any other comments? I'm Penelope uh, Axelsen. I'm from Danish Science Communication. No, now it's called Danish Science Factory. Sorry. In Denmark, it's a small NGO. We make the National Science Week in Denmark, and every year we make this mass participation project for school children, engaging 1,000 classes in Denmark, and that's a lot in Denmark. And um, we've done that for uh, eight years now. This year we are investigating again the indoor climate in the classrooms. It's quite bad in Denmark. And, um, and uh, next year we want to go uh, European with this uh, mass participation project. We are in close dialogue with uh, Spain, Daniel, uh, and uh, with uh, Sweden and Poland and uh, Germany. With, uh, we, we, the structure is that the experiments should have uh, local uh, funding but we would like to do it, uh, the same experiment in many countries. So if any of you are interested to hear more, you're welcome to contact me afterwards. We call it the Emacs project. Any question for the European Commission? For the European Commission, please. <laughs> I'd, I'd just like to raise one point and maybe get some, some opinions. I, I think you raised in your, your very nice uh, um, overview, uh, you mentioned the issue of SMEs. And uh, I wonder to what extent uh, the European Commission is thinking of this area in particular as an area to stimulate um, economic growth. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for startups, uh, small startups, which can be nonprofits. Uh, in this area um, to, to, so that citizens can actually organize citizen science. Is that, is that a topic you've looked into? Is it something you would specifically fund in the future? Well, <clears throat> I can only uh, talk about uh, the topic that we are launching in 2014 and 2015. Uh, actually, the topic uh, on f the follow-up on student observatories uh, will be an innovation action, which means that we are targeting um, real um, demonstrations, deployment in real scenarios. And for that, we are also mm, having included in the text that SMEs have to be included. 
in the consortia because they are um, essential uh, both for the technological developments and also uh, for engaging citizens um, and uh, also um, so so in that sense we we, we are targeting uh, but there are also, um, in a more general way, the SME instruments in Horizon 2020, but I'm not very aware about uh, what are the topics that they are actually targeting, but I'm pretty sure that there are also uh, topics related to, to citizens' engagement. So I don't know if you want. I'm afraid I can only profess my ignorance in a way. I mean, we're, we're doing a lot of works on SMEs. We're doing what we've briefly presented to you today on citizen science. I, I think, speaking for DG Connect, we haven't joined those two groups simply because we don't have any evidence. If you have something or if there's anything that show, suggests such a, such a link, then we'd be delighted to use it. But I don't think we have anything for, for the moment. But. Yeah, I mean, uh, you could argue that I don't know that much about uh, about SMEs or industry or that side of, of of the EU, but you could argue why companies need uh, kind of e EU research funding to engage with citizens, right? Isn't I mean that's what companies do every day, isn't it? They gather data about their you know their their users or their clients. Or am I wrong? No? Um, I have maybe a bit of information about the SME instrument uh, because I submitted a proposal a couple of months ago. I don't think there is any specific call related to citizens' engagement. There's, of course, an ICT part of the instrument uh, that deals with early stage, highly innovative, high risk uh, activities. Uh, but I, to be honest, reading the text of the call, I wouldn't be convinced that that's the right instrument for citizens' engagement. So maybe I, I could specify a bit more. I, I'm thinking not necessarily, although it could be for-profit companies um, making software that's useful or whatever, but I think there's a lot of NGOs in the citizen science space that could do with a helping hand. Uh, I've just come from the US. Uh, there's a fantastic group called Public Lab there, uh, and they struggle to get funding from the National Science Foundation and, and other uh, national uh, support organizations because they're outside of mainstream academic world. But they're doing great work, and I'm, I'm sure in Europe uh, it's a similar issue. Yeah. Same, the same topic addresses with grassroots movements and individuals. I think it's a challenge for the policy makers to think in new instruments and funding mechanisms for uh, for individuals bring new actors into the into the establishment uh, I wonder if Peter it's good that you included in your presentation how do you get funded because we uh, use Sorry, we usually think if you are doing this with your passion and your extra time, what could you do if you had regular funding mechanism, right? I could change the world. <laughs> I could change the world. It's a, yeah, it's um, no. I'm, I'm I'm really indeed looking looking forward to hearing answers to this question. So so I'm I'm e as eager as to finding questions to that uh, answers to that question as you are. Um, but uh, right now, yeah, we see a lot of people that, that just do it as part of their job. I'm, uh, I'm working at the Ghent University as my, as my full-time job, and I'm just also doing Open Knowledge Foundation Belgium in my, in my spare time, and also as part of my job because I'm doing research on open data, so it's, it's really related to, to my PhD. Um, so uh, that, that's also the case for a lot of people who are, who are working within Open Knowledge Foundation Belgium. They're, they're already doing something similar uh, as part of their job. So it's like an extension uh, to, to, to their job. It's their passion, their job, so they also do it in their spare time. Um, but uh, I see a lot of, um, a lot of like, more, more technical people. Some would call them nerds or geeks or, or, or whatever, but these are very, very, uh, very nice people that, that, that are focusing on, 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 a, on a project that, that 
I think they really should get all all the money that that is out there because they really get work done. They they are uh, they they are not uh, going to to jump on another project because they are really focused on that project. Uh, and these are not so not so uh, well funded, I think. Like like for instance, uh, these people who are contributing on the open source uh, in the in open source projects. Uh, for instance, uh, on, on, on the Linux kernel, or um, or more tangible on, on uh, projects like apps on, on top of open data. I think the, the the best work is just done by only one person in a room behind behind closed curtains sometimes, but that's not always bad. It's 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 like the best work or the best apps that that come out of that. So uh, I always dreamt of, 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 of some kind of, of, uh, of uh, funding tool where just one person could get funded on, 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 a, on a larger project that, that he just created in his bedroom. Yeah. She, or she, sorry. I have to repeat one sentence from John. It's very important. Uh, they need evidence and you, need, you are willing to have uh, feedback from the people and if you share your voice, you say your concerns in the online consultation and so on, you have to do it to prove that there is ongoing amazing stuff and you need uh, this measure and this action from the policy makers. They are willing to do it. Uh, so far as I know, as far as I know, they are really open and re they want you to get on board, but you have to be ready also to, to be there. Maybe there's a, a space for a community, for a support action on dissemination on this kind of stuff, but just make use of the tools. Thank you. I hope we can do it together. So we should keep uh, stay in touch and uh, try to try to achieve that together. Yeah. Just to emphasize this uh, from the RI tools perspective, every time we ask civil society organizations. Yeah, they tell us that they need more support to get engaged in research projects. They don't have a way to get funded. They are not evenly weighted in terms of a research project. And yeah, projects like Consider, I think they are developing recommendations in this way and it's a claim. Yes. I'm Camille Pisani from the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences here in Brussels. I must first apologize to have missed the first speech, so if my question goes wrong, just tell me. Um, I've been hearing with a large, uh, much interest all the projects reported here, and they are of very diverse kind, with ver various agenda, from crowdsourcing to uh, co-creation of the research agenda, and between what has been said about uh, the last example, for example, uh, or uh, what was said before in uh, relation to our I tools, there is just a huge uh, uh, diversity. But I may be wrong, but an, an issue has not been addressed, or must not been addressed, it is, um, uh, the existing tool or the ex existing tool of assessing the impact of every single project, whatever the agenda behind it is. Um, I'm not speaking about activity reports. I'm not speaking about quantity, petaflops or whatever. I'm speaking about how to have a, the slightest idea of what has been changed in the citizen behavior as an individual or as a group after the end of the project, according to the goals of the project. And I wonder if it would be possible to think to a specific uh, uh, instrument to promote that research. From my experience, I've been working in a science museum and science center for years, and this is an informal learning places where we have been considering that issue for very, very long. And it is really, really difficult, even today, to have more than, let's say, local outcomes specific to every single project we have uh, been doing. And citizen science, because of the size and because of the tools, is raising new issues regarding the way it may change locally or globally, individually or as a group, the behavior the, of, of citizens as citizens or towards science. And I think that it would be definitely really interesting to 
support specific research in that respect because from my experience we need to develop even new methodology just to, to follow it and I, I, would, I would like to know if it's already considered or it, if it can be considered. Um, certainly, so because Zooniverse so has over a million users, uh, I know that as a group they are aware that they have a hugely valuable data set to study exactly what you, uh, about what you talk about. So there has been, there has been some effort to, uh, I know there has been, uh, there was a study a few years ago, but that was very much kind of in, um, inviting Zooniverse users to fill in a survey basically about um, you know, who they are, what their motivations are, where they are, what, you know, lots of things about, about the kind of people who take part and why they would do that. Um, and I know, but I would have to sort of check what the funding stream is, etc. But um, I know that there is quite a, uh, quite a large project going on within Zooniverse to kind of study also more closely um, things like motivations of users, etc. Uh, it doesn't answer the question entirely. But I know that uh, groups like Zooniverse are, are very much thinking about that and how to actually measure what their projects are doing for the users. Thank you. Uh, I'm Isabel from the Bono from the University of Barcelona, and I presented the Urban BBs project. Maybe you you didn't. Uh, and one part of the, the answer could come from social sciences. So we think that really we have to fill the gap between uh, physics or whatever, art science and social sciences. And for example, the workshop we did, uh, we had a social scientist uh, present here and taking note and observing all the processes. Um, it was um, quite odd because we were thinking that we were doing everything uh, on a horizontal basis and we were not. And so we really learned a lot and now we are about to publish a paper on that. But I think really social sciences and anthropology can help a lot uh, in that way. I completely agree that it can or they could. Uh, provided that they are invited to do it and that a substantial part of the funding of the project are devoted to it because it's really difficult to, 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 to build a new corpus in this specific field that, is, that can be shared amongst different projects if there is not a long-term investment in, again, uh, building new methodology in the field under the umbrella of so social sciences or uh, psychology, or um, there are very sev uh, there are several uh, disciplines that can be invited to take part of it. Um. And uh, I'm really glad to learn that it's not completely forgotten. Uh, I don't know if it is gathered, and if there is a form to exchange what has been learned, and so that we can progress more actively in it. Um, in the past, there was a lot of uh, learning regarding informal sciences with, with a, uh, magazine, journals, publication. I wonder if it's still start, it's, it is starting in the field uh, of, or better said, if it is extended to the new field of citizen sciences. And I'm, th this is really addressing the way that the projects are funded, in particular, or evaluated before funding. If this is considered as a mandatory part of the project or not, I would, of course, be in favor that it's a mandatory part, because all this will be forgotten very soon, I think, if we don't do this. Are there actually any social scientists here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> UK and that was actually my mission uh, here today is to actually come as a social scientist to actually look at where social science can actually where, where do we marry and I can see lots of dovetails really uh, there's a lot of history in participatory user-led research uh, there's methodologies what's being developed 
Uh, and I think our approach is a common approach. Uh, and there's networks as well out there, but I think for some reason they've not communicated, we've not talked. And so part of my mission actually to this event was actually to come to explore what you're doing in the natural sciences and to look at how we can uh, dovetail and hopefully work together. Because I do agree, we do need to evaluate the, how it changes citizens' behaviour and how it impacts on citizens and it impacts on the communities in which they live as well. So I'll be interested to talk afterwards. Maybe I can say something with regard to the scientists because it was part um, of the project and the working package to have an evaluation of um, experience which were implemented within the projects and there we had a look at motivators and impacts um, on volunteer side and we applied quantitative and qualitative social science research methods. Well, maybe there will be produced some papers out of it soon. We have also linked uh, social science with digital technologies and to understand the, this digital social science, it's called, I think, something like that. We are using participatory experiment to understand human behavior by posing questions like prisoner's dilemma with thousands of people playing and sharing real money and things, stuff like that. Uh, we have done some experiments like that. But it's clear that understanding the real impact of every, of re, its research, it's very important. And I think there are already some funding mechanisms and some specific calls for that. Inviting, uh, I think it was called ICT Human Centric Digital Aids or something like that, ICT 31. And it was an ICT call asking for anthropologists or ethnography researchers to to understand the, the, the digital society itself, right? And this is part of the, this is one of the, the things I like very much from, personally, from citizen science, to perform participatory experiments to understand the digital society itself. This, uh, when you ask people to volunteer, like, to contribute to a participatory experiment, this is what we understand as citizen science also. Not only understand, uh, doing the internet science or research on Twitter to understand human behavior, it's okay. But it's not really this uh, engagement activity uh, of citizen science. But we, when you ask, we want to run a real experiment, you are informed with the term of, uh, of all disclaimer and everything and everything. They are engaged for a research purpose. Yeah, and just uh, adding to that, I think it's really discourse what separates us. I think in practice we're doing the same thing. Uh, we're just naming it differently, which is preventing us from talking about what we're doing. So that needs to be addressed as well, the language, what we're using in the natural and in the social sciences. Sorry, if you are interested in getting together to do some, some research work on this, though, I, I draw your attention to our call for the collective awareness platforms, which is closing in March 2015. And I think work like this could, be, could fit under there if you were creative in how you present it and get the right people together. Okay, just, just one comment. Uh, Candida Silva, I'm also part of the Societized Consortium. Uh, during the consultation for the white paper, uh, we did uh, talk to and interview a lot of people from social science and researchers, asking them how to evaluate and how to evaluate the, the collaboration of citizens and what, especially what was the impact on, on their lives. And uh, the conclusions were, were, very, were very difficult. Of course, you can always count how many people participated and are for how long, but this is not really the true impact of the project. And even uh, people from social science, what they actually said, it was probably the evaluation needs to be done not during the time that the project is running, but maybe in two or three years' time. Only then will you understand the true impact of it on the people that participate. And this, of course, raises a, a question because usually fund, you get the, f the funding for a closed period of time, so you cannot perform uh, evaluation assessment 
two or three years after that. And even the, the researchers that, that developed these projects and that also are uh, very involved in science communication, they say that for them it was more important if a, if a person on the subway would get to them 10 years later and, and say, I still remember what you taught in, in that talk, then if, if he asked an equation that he presented, uh, you know, 30 minutes later, because he would still remember. So I think evaluation is probably the trickiest part within citizen science uh, projects, uh, because I think this project, I mean, this is more or less a personal opinion, these pro projects have more impact throughout your life than just in the moment that people participate. And I think this for evaluation is, is probably one of the critical aspects. Um, just slightly related uh, comments, kind of something I guess for the, for the funders to think about as well, and that's getting, you know, getting a bit philosophical really, but um, you know, when you fund programs, it's like how do you trade off the kind of the scientific output of the project versus the experience of the user or the impact on the actual participants? I don't, I don't know the answer. I don't know if anybody has strong opinions about that, but I mean, that, that's obviously something to, to consider as well. Sorry. Luisa Marino from Excite. Uh, just a comment to complement what has been said about citizen engagement and the impact, uh, so not related to your uh, question, sorry. <laughs> um, I was involved in a project uh, where we uh, consulted citizens and um, the aim was to gather uh, ideas and opinions to shape EU policies, in particular it was on waste, so the, the project uh, is called Voices for Innovation. Um, so what I noticed um, in this um, pan-European consultation and pilot project um, was that uh, the strongest motivation for citizens to engage in such a project was the commitment uh, of the European Commission to really take into consideration their opinions and to shape EU policies with citizens' opinions. So, uh, because at the beginning of the, pro of the process, they were very skeptical and they were said, ah, okay, uh, I'm not sure, I want to participate in this uh, consultation, it's nothing going to change after my, you know, input. But actually, the most important element was to get him back to those citizens and say, look, your ideas are into new uh, Horizon 2020 calls um, for proposal, and so you really did, uh, I mean, you really helped, and your ideas really had an impact on uh, shaping EU, EU policies. Can I stay here for a long <laughs> Just a logistic issue. You can go to have lunch later in the canteen, keep your bags with you, okay? But more comments? Well, just a, a follow on for that technical uh, lo logistic I issue. If you're not going to go to lunch here, please leave your badges here because we need to reuse them. And, um, but if you are, then leave them back here afterwards, please. Okay, but I don't know if you have any wrapping up. Two minutes more to think and uh, set your voice. So the, you've created this, there's this white paper now. What, what happens next? What is, you know, what's going to happen with this program? What does this feed into? Can you explain that a little? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, I, in my opinion, most of the issues that you said, it is not addressed here, it, they are addressed in the white paper, okay? I, mean, I remember that that privacy issues, we mentioned we need further the understanding of the whole impact of the contribution, privacy, ethical differences am, uh, among the countries and so on. Also about um, the different assessment of evaluation. I, please check that, okay? Uh, and 
as I said, it is a picture, a static picture of the what has been doing for the last two years, this kind of discussion. We saw up the evidence for the Digital Science Unit to consider this for their future funding programs. I don't know, we are not addressing Horizon 2020, we are not addressing the funding programs in Germany or whatever. We are just saying this needs to be done. Um, who knows who is going to deal with that? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think for a, for a teeny project or important project like Sosentai, 200 contributors are already good numbers because we covered different, many, many different stakeholders from different profiles as today. It's a challenge to organize and so on and so on. But I think the, the endorsement of the community is very, very important. So as far as I know, you will take that into account. And then it's up to your uh, supervisor and the, the new uh, bosses that uh, provide you the, the funding mechanisms and the, the budget to, to promote that, right? I don't know. Um, yeah, because I can't, I, I can't speak on behalf of the new commission, but, uh, <laughs> but no, what we will, we will use the, the white paper from Socian Ties, we'll use the consultation we've just launched, we'll use any input we get from you to do to do what we can do at the Commission, but that's fairly limited. We have some money, not that much, and we can, we can do policy papers, and that's one of, the, one of the things in our arsenal that we will use. We probably will do a communication on digital science or open science or citizen science in the next year. But that, that's only part of it because, I mean, the whole, the whole ethos of this community is one that it's, it's self-organizing and self-aware and it doesn't need any centralized role of the Commission. So we're just one player, we can have an impact, but I think you look to each other and as you've done inside Societize, this is a very nice example of what the community has done for itself as well. I'm not trying to get off the hook, I'm just trying to... I, I really want you to pass the, the white paper with the different units in the, in the digital, yeah. in the European Commission. Uh, not only DG Research, DG Connect, but also DG Education, DG Communication to, to adopt yeah. what's going on in the citizen science community for your daily lives and the way you are uh, sharing your concerns. Hopefully, we make impact. We don't know in the short term, in the long term, we'll see. And Claudia, what are ne the next steps from ECSA? The next steps of EXA. I think we're going to debate those at the General Assembly in November. And then, um, but basically it's about, yeah, um, getting funding, getting projects together and um, start many things of, um, yeah, I think it just comes up and up again. We want to take on the RRI frameworks um, and develop this further, so see what comes from there. Um, also to see the citizen science white paper, yeah, you know, I mean, I think now we have this, you said it so rightly, it's, it's moving very fast and things are sprawling up um, and people are talking to it, each other now. Um, um, and I think we have to, yeah, go on working um, about that. And yeah, for this we need money and we're writing proposals and uh, come talk and write with us and then um, let's continue this. But I had the other question, um, how can we get maybe involved in, um, um, is, is there a possibility to get involved in, in the consultation or something like this for the policy document that you are planning to publish in next spring? Indeed. I mean, well, first of all, there's the consultation I just mentioned, so I, I urge you, you can answer that on, I, either as a, an individual or on behalf of the organization, so I'd very warmly invite uh, your organization to, to respond on that. You can also follow up afterwards bilaterally with us. There's always scope. We're, we're, we're always ready to receive uh, intelligent input. Uh, hello. Uh, just a comment. My name is Velo Runnel. I'm from Estonia, University of Tartu. Uh, uh, Claudia, after uh, EXOS um, meeting, actually there is a one day after that is a meeting, stakeholder meeting of another uh, Framework 7 project, EU Bonn. Uh, 
and uh, I'm also representing this project. Uh, we are dealing with biodiversity data uh, integration and also mobilization uh, through uh, citizen science. And uh, I think uh, we also uh, have, uh, have a input for policy making. So I, I guess we could also channel it through, uh, through EXA. And I myself is, is, uh, am uh, in one of the uh, working group uh, dealing with tools. Uh, so I think uh, tools for uh, biodiversity data, uh, getting the data through citizen science is it's really important aspect. And I think uh, we'd like to see uh, in uh, European policies. Uh, yeah, okay. There is another important event I would like to mention with you, organized by the Citizen Science Association in the States in February in San Jose, so check it out also, maybe it's another opportunity to come together. Because I always have the same feeling in this kind of meetings, why don't we sit together and prepare joint proposals and so on, but we are getting flying back <laughs> later today, we are all right, I don't know. Okay, so maybe we can wrap up. I think uh, I'm very happy with the outcomes of today for the speakers. Every, thank you everybody for those who could come and for those who are not here. Um, we have a clear understanding that many things are happening in the citizen science environment. The Societies has been linked somehow to all of them. We are not the, the protagonist today at all, but we it's important to interconnect and connect and to facilitate this kind of uh, common scenarios. Uh, we have brought policy measure, policy actors, uh, activists, uh, exhibition and museums, uh, educational networks and so on. And there are big uh, passion in the community and I think it's it's important to keep on working for citizen science. But we need the all of us to really demonstrate it. I keep on answering the boys and be bold and keep on working in creative projects. And so let's see, hopefully. Thank you for all of you. And so sometimes it's finishing, I forgot to mention, in, the, in two months, but we have many, many opportunities to keep on working and, and hopefully. Okay. I'll put you on the spot now, but how do you? intend to keep uh, the community together or is there have you any plans for some kind of uh, staying in touch of the of the different partners or ha if people want to follow up with the what you've done what 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 can they do with Sosentais and there are many um, Sosentais will be run and uh, we we have uh, still some experiment that will the online the sum for all experiment will be running and, and so on. So the community will, will be in an unfunded effort, uh, approach, okay, let's say. And, but uh, my approach, personally, or the Societies approach, maybe the next forum is European Citizen Science Association, or maybe the next forum to meet is whatever, you know. So uh, we have to demonstrate what, and it is a self-emergent scenario. We are not forcing anybody to, to, to join us at all. But we are all connected online, so the open. Any other comment? So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>